here, Stephanie, that you could make it, Amy, Madeline, Terry, Nisi, all the regulars, good to see you all here. Hey, Jealousy, uh, Yvonne Phillips, uh, SMK Valinsky, I know you couldn't make it, or I think you missed some of the live last time. So I hope the advance notice helped. Jean Karras, good to see you. Um, am I missing anyone? Robbie, Robbie Robin. Um, I see a couple of you have also already voted. And uh, it will be interesting to see if that vote changes. So the format of this episode... So first of all, I'll be, well, that actually hurt my rib slightly picking up the book the way I did. Um, the, the, um, the format is going to be, we're going to be reading from this book, citing from this book, right? It is uh, Martin Bailey's um, book on Van Gogh's finale, the, the last two months of his life. And we're reading from chapter 17, it's this chapter which is titled Suicide or Murder. Um, just to put you guys in context, Timmy, I really don't want to pick you up. Come. Come, boy. Come. Jump. Jump. Come. Jump, 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 jump. Come on. Jump. Jump. Come. Come on. Jump. Do you have to be so lazy, hey? Okay, there we go. I'm going to have to throw you off when I uh, refer to the book again, when I need to be paging through the book. So um, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to take you through the chapter. Um, the first run through, we're just sort of going to go through his five reinforcing arguments for, for why he believes it's definitely a suicide, right? And so I'm going to kind of run through it with you in a, in a sort of not a, not, not a neutral way. I'm just going to take you through what he says, right? So, so I'm not going to analyze it. I'm not going to interpret it. I'm not going to um, – give any insights or arguments. I'm just going to sort of lay it out there. So I'm pretty much just going to tell you what he's saying. So we're going to go through the five arguments based on his perspective, right? And that's going to be the first run through. And that is where the ball's in your court, where it's up to you to think critically. It's, it's where, you, where you can decide Actually, that actually makes a lot of sense, right? In other words, my bias is absent from it. My um, analysis is absent from it. And it's really up to you to, um, you know, based on your insight, your intuition, your um, education in this case, to say yay or nay. I agree with that and I don't agree with that. I'm, I'm going to... Um, what's the word I'm going to prepare you before we even get to, to his arguments that there are quite good arguments. I'm, I'm not going to say all five arguments are crap. They are pretty good arguments. The question is, are they good enough? Are they uh, complete enough? Um, and, and then ultimately, it is a competition <laughs> It is a competition. It's a true crime researcher and a true crime investigative writer versus a art historian. And so, you know, you, you can kind of ask the question, does someone with a expertise or knowledge or experience in true crime, can they um, speak intelligently about what seems to be a very niche subject, um, a, a world-famous artist who died 130 years ago, who 
who is who is the real expert in that story? Is it the art historian who's written many books about this one case, um, or is it the true crime amateur? You know, who who do you trust? Where are you getting a credible version of what really happened? Which standards sit better with you? In other words, who do you who should you go to for your expertise? And um, that is your decision. That that's up to you to decide. You know what you make of that. And um, it's probably a little bit unfair if if Martin Bailey is watching this. He, he probably might think this is a little bit unfair because this is a true crime channel. Obviously, you've got true crime supporters, so obviously they're going to support you. I, I don't know if that's the case because I'm going to be presenting his arguments and as they are. And um, any reasonable person can then say, yeah, that makes sense to me. But that also makes sense to me. Oh, um, based on this very educated opinion, it is very educated. Um, I learned a couple of things reading his book that I didn't know before. I learned a few details that I didn't know before. I've also got to say there were things that I did know that were in conflict with the things that he said and things that he seems to know. Um, but it's really up to you to think critically and to, to say, I, um, in, in, in a, almost to act as a juror, to say, um, as the jury, my opinion is X, Y, Z, and, and that is, that's, the, that's the situation. So, um, so, so maybe we should get to it. So right now, there have there've been almost 40 votes, 75%, three quarters of you believe he was murdered. And we'll see if that number changes. Um, there are well, only 49 of you watching, but so that's still 10 of you could still vote. And maybe, um, maybe there'll, there'll be other people who aren't really participating that might be new to this live stream that might come along and go, no, 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 he's definitely committed suicide. We'll see. Um, just having a look at some of your other comments. Um, Terry says the time slot doesn't work for me again, but I'll pop in when I can and enjoy the replay. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, the time slot that I'm using is sort of when a lot of Americans have come home from work. So it's sort of 7 p.m. in America, give or take one or two hours. Of course, if you're in the UK, it's past one o'clock in the morning, I think. I don't know what the time is in Australia, but I can't really um, try and accommodate um, the non-Americans because um, you guys are in the minority. So, I mean, it's even an awkward time for me. I'm doing this live stream at one o'clock in the morning local time. Um, so that's really the situation. Uh, something else I must also um, also say is I, I mentioned in the previous live stream that whenever I put up a uh, live on Van Gogh, I lose about 10 or 20 followers. So you may have noticed that I previously had, um, uh, what is it? I think 86,700 and something followers. Now I've got... 86,000, I think it's 600 and something. The last time I looked at it was exactly 86,700. So um, so it kind of comes at a bit of a cost. You know, um, this particular topic is not one that interests most of the folks on this channel. Um, obviously, it interests those who are the members but it does actually kind of cost me subscribers. Uh, to be honest, um, am I losing sleep about it? I certainly don't like it. Am I losing any sleep about it? Not really. Um, right now, I'm not in an acquisitive phase on, on, on uh, YouTube. I'm not, I've sort of designated April as a, um, a month that I'm not going to be churning out content. I'm not going to be um, as prolific as I can be because I want to rest um, and I want to just 
um, uh, almost recharge my mind in a way, just because I've, I've been going through a little bit of trauma, um, and and for for other reasons as well, because I, I have been working um, quite hard for quite a long time. So I kind of want to do other things. I want to work on audio books a little bit more than I have been. Um, I'm also preparing myself for the uh, Morphe trial, which requires quite a lot of stamina because that's every day. I also don't, that's also a case where I don't expect to get a terrible amount of, of followers, but that's also okay with me. Um, I mean, I, I realize that there's some cases uh, where you can acquire 10, 20, 30,000 followers just by um, f covering a case. In other words, just by, by being consistent on a particular new case, you can, through the course of that case, you can acquire 10, 20, 30,000 followers. And so when that's happening, then, then, then that's it. Then you, you lock yourself into that whole process. And, um, you know, so to worry about, I'm putting up a Van Gogh video, I'm losing 20 subscribers. Well, I think the good side to that is, you are your you the audience that you have is the audience that will stick by you and are more sort of flexible and more sort of um, I guess they they know you. So it's not just like um, uh, oh you didn't put up a Nicole Kessinger video. I'm never listening to you again, kind of thing. Um, incidentally, I have actually been working on. Um, I was spent about two hours, maybe an hour, listening to the interview that she gave, the, the video interview, and just seeing things and hearing things in a completely new way. And, and that's always fascinating for me in true crime, where you, you spend so much time on a case and then you, you see things in a, <clears throat> a completely new way. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a sore throat, so you must excuse me if I take a lozenger. I just hope my throat does handle this particular um, live stream. Stephanie says, your passion for Van Gogh shines through. Do you guys notice what is behind me in this particular episode? It's the, it's not a Van Gogh painting. So this is where we are dealing with true crime rocket science, where we're dealing with this from a true crime perspective. And some of you, as we've been going through the Van Gogh series, may have felt it feels, where's the true crime element? Well, you're definitely going to feel it in this episode. Sharon Tuck from Canada says, hi, good to see you here. Jean, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Karras says, uh, maybe you can contact Lauren Shaw for an interview. Uh, that would increase your visibility on the Morphew case. Not sure what you mean by that. Am I interviewing her or is she interviewing me? Um, I've kind of written off journalists. I I've, um, I'm a journalist myself and I've engaged with journalists a lot in true crime. And I'm kind of in a in a phase now where I've written them off. I don't really, um, I'm happy to read what they do, but I'm not really happy to engage with them um, because it becomes a credibility contest and it becomes um, something that, that eventually doesn't sit very well with me, so. But uh, that's an interesting idea. Lauren Sharp's got her own commentary, so, you know, um, I think, and she is involved with a channel, her own channel, her own news agency. I'm pretty sure that she would like to keep it that way. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Good point, uh, Yvonne Phillips. Okay, so we're going to get going on this chapter. It's on page 135 of chapter 17. And apologies, I've got a lozenge in my mouth, so it might um, be a bit gross to to hear and see for a while, but my throat's definitely needing a bit of care. So before I even touch on this, I want to provide a little bit of context. So first of all, this book was written, um, this book was published last year in October, and that followed a lot of controversy about Van Gogh's death. Right, so he didn't write this book and he didn't write this chapter, Suicide or Murder, and that then led to the controversy. The controversy was already there. Um, I published my book, The Murder of Vincent Van Gogh, um, I don't know, um, I think 2017 or 2018, so four or five years before this book came out, I published my book on that. But there have been other books on the same subject. Um, and so he, he's actually very late to the game. But I don't want to disparage that. I want to say that what you're reading here is a very modern, a very topical, a very current assessment and analysis of the debate. So in other words, the fact that he's coming sort of at the end, is almost providing a kind of an afterword, a kind of a final, what's the word, um, not judgment, but kind of like a final assessment to say, I've got all of this information, I've seen this book, I've seen that documentary, I've, I know about this, I know about that, and this is the most modern, up-to-date assessment of all the information and as an art expert, this is my, my point of view. So I think it's quite important to stress that. The other thing that I think is quite important to stress from a true crime perspective is that there are quite a few cases where the question suicide or murder also comes up. One of them is Rebecca Zahal. And I've written two books on Rebecca Zahal and the Rebecca Zahal case is a case where the official cause of death, the, the official um, belief from the sheriff's office, the, the official position of law enforcement is that she committed suicide. That is not the position of many other people, including myself. That's also not the position of her own family. Um, and one can go into that even further. But the Rebecca Zahal case is a really good example of a was it murder or was it suicide investigation. Thanks a lot, Susan Becker. Good to see you here. Um, another case that's kind of the opposite to Rebecca Zahal is Brian Laundry, which is quite recent, where there's also some speculation, nothing near to Rebecca Zahal, but also was did Brian Laundry commit suicide or was he murdered? Um, the, the reason that there's a little bit of um, speculation, a little bit of questions around his death and the manner of death is because he was right-handed and apparently he shot himself with his left hand. And so that is definitely a legitimate question. On the other hand, you would say, were the circumstances surrounding what happened to him, were the circumstances surrounding Brian Laundry something that one could imagine could drive him to suicide? And to me, the answer is unambiguously yes. He was in love with somebody that ended tragically and... So, you know, that is something that weighed on him. Um, the Suzanne Morphew case is also, to some extent, um, there, there's a, 
there's a little bit of speculation, not a lot, but there's a little bit of speculation that, um, you know, could she have committed suicide? Is that why she disappeared? Suicide does come up a little bit in the Barry Morphy affidavit. Um, of the three cases that I've mentioned, Rebecca Zaha, Brian Laundry, and and Suzanne Morphy, I would say the suicide narrative is the least relevant and the, the least um, significant, if that's the word, in that particular case. But it's nevertheless has come up a little bit. Um, Stephanie's put a link to the first book in the Rebecca Zahar book. Um, Susan, Susan, Susan Becker says, some creators lost subs by the last update. Stephanie says, I highly recommend next book. Do you mean the Rebecca Zahar book or in general? Okay. So now we're going to deal with um, Bailey's assessment. And I'd love to read the whole chapter, but, you know, um, if I was the writer of, of, if I was the writer, I wouldn't want someone reading my work verbatim, certainly not without my permission. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of highlights. You can see I've just sort of highlighted the couple of things. And he basically um, touches on the recent debate and the recent speculation that whether it was suicide or murder. So the very first sentence, he says, until 2011, meaning about 10 years ago, right, 10, 11 years ago. So for basically the last 120 years since Van Gogh died, and I'm quoting from what he says, he says, it was almost universally assumed that Van Gogh had died by his own hand. His death had always been regarded as suicide. So it's for the past 10 years, and it's not like uh, um, for one year in the past 10 years, someone thought, oh, it could have been like that. It's, uh, it's speculation that, that I think has gained, um, gained more and more attention. It's gained traction. It's gotten, certainly gotten legs in a way. And as a result, there's, he's got a chapter in his book dedicated to that whole idea. And um, this chapter directly follows the funeral chapter. So chapter 16 is Vincent van Gogh's funeral in his book. And the very next chapter is, was it suicide or murder? Um, Then he refers to a couple of sources. Um, one of them is Van Gogh, The Life by Steve, Stephen Nife and Gregory White Smith. Um, and he points out here that he says, surprisingly little is known about the incident that caused Vincent Van Gogh's death. And then he, he says, this is correct, details are sparse. Um, I don't want to start analyzing right now, but I disagree with that completely. I think the the details around his death are actually quite comprehensive. We know the trajectory of the bullet. We know the sight of the bullet. We know the type of gun. We know sort of what time of day it happened. We know what he said about it. We know that the police came there. We know what he's kind of what he said to his brother. We know all the circumstances around Dr. Gachet coming and going. We know what the innkeeper's daughter said and what she witnessed. We know that, and this is absolutely sort of universal. We know that the gun was never found. There's nobody that says, um, 
they found maybe they found the gun a day later or a week later. We know that the gun, in terms of the circumstances of the case, the gun was never found at the scene. Um, so I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, for a 130-year-old case, we know quite a lot. In a in a weird way, we, we seem to almost know more about Van Gogh's death than Suzanne Morphew's disappearance. Um, I mean, one of the big differences between those two cases might seem a strange thing to compare, but you at least have Van Gogh's body to work with. You can say, well, he was clearly shot. Um, we know where he was shot, when he was shot, um, and, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, whereas with Suzanne Morphew, she kind of just disappeared. Um, he also refers, I don't really want to go into this, but he talks about the Lust for Life form, which I feel really cemented and solidified and crystallized the Van Gogh legend in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world, in the global public's mind. That movie and that book basically established Van Gogh as an artist, but also established his story as the sort of tragic artist. Um, I'm not going to go through everything he says here, but he does talk about um, a person called René Secretan, who was a young visitor to Orvez, and he says that um, René Secretan had taken a revolver from Ravu. So, so now you've kind of got this Remember we were saying, did Van Gogh take the revolver from him? Did, where did Van Gogh get the gun? Did he get it from Dr. Gachet? Did he get it from the innkeeper or did he buy it somewhere? And now this story is that maybe some other dude took it from the innkeeper. Once again, you have the same problem. If it was taken from the innkeeper, why would the innkeeper not say, well, you know what, so weird. My gun was taken at the time Van Gogh disappeared. Why wouldn't you say that? Why wouldn't that be something he conveyed to his daughter? But anyway, that is a different story. Um, and then Rene claimed, this is what I've highlighted, Rene Secretan claimed that Van Gogh stole the gun, meaning um, what's sort of been suggested here is Rene Secretan took the gun, but then he said Van Gogh took the gun, something like that. Um, so he goes on to, at the bottom of page 135, he says, quote, the knife and Smith theory was subsequently taken up in slightly different forms in two acclaimed films. So subsequent to 2011. So you didn't just have this book coming out, movies came out based on the book. Um, and so he, he refers to Loving Vincent, which came out in 2017, which inspired my book. Um, that came out in 2017 and it was largely based on um, the knife and Smith theory, not completely, but to, to some extent based on that. And then also at Eternity's Gate the following year, just a year later, 2018, Julian Schnabel's At Eternity's Gate came out, which I thought was a particularly terrible film. I was really looking forward to it. The opening montage I thought was excellent and as the film went on it just got to me more and more silly and absurd and in my, I've done quite a lot of episodes on Van Gogh there's a playlist of them I uh, deal with At Eternity's Gate in detail in that playlist. Okay so now we go on to page 136 Um, so I guess just to summarize, um, the, let's, let, how can I put this succinctly? Um, at the time that I wrote my book, you had basically two theories. And the theory was, first of all, the traditional theory was that Van Gogh had committed suicide, right? 
at the time that I wrote my book, another, another theory had materialized, and that and that was that Van Gogh had been shot accidentally. And although um, that seemed to fall into the category of murder in terms of everyone who was talking about it, as a true crime writer, I immediately recognized that, well, that's not murder. If he's shot accidentally, it's not murder. It means, it means first of all, he didn't commit suicide, but it does mean someone shot him, but not purposefully, not with intent, and not to murder him. So it's not murder, right? So in other words, when I wrote my book, The Murder of Vincent Van Gogh, there wasn't this idea that someone had purposefully with motive, with intent, murdered him. There was this idea that he didn't commit suicide, but he was shot accidentally. So essentially you've got three possibilities, not two. It's not suicide or murder. It's actually suicide, an accidental shooting or murder, right? Um, so on page 136, Bailey writes, quote, the biographers, meaning Knife and Smith, quote, did not explicitly claim in their book that it was murder, suggesting instead some sort of accident. That's exactly what I've said. Um, then he talks about, now he's sort of, what Bailey's sort of doing now is he's sort of criticizing this, scenario which which I agree with I agree that that he wasn't shot accidentally I also agree that if he was shot accidentally there would be no need to cover it up there would no, be no need to um, how can I put it um, you know there, there wouldn't be such a serious charge um, it is also says why would the victim not have said so so if he was shot accidentally why wouldn't Van Gogh just have said, it was all a mistake. Uh, you know, we were fooling around and I got shot accidentally. Don't blame anybody. Now, why would he have said that? Um, so that also comes up, this thing of why did Van Gogh say that if something else happened? Um, he also talks about this idea of, in this scenario, that, that, Van Gogh is shielding his friend René by taking all the blame onto himself. So in other words, René Secretan shoots him. It's all a mistake. But because of the kind of dude that Van Gogh is, he basically says, don't blame anyone else. Um, I did this. And so what he's doing is he's shielding René, right? And so my um, version of that is that Van Gogh is protecting Theo through the story. In other words, Van Gogh taking, in my scenario, the blame onto himself, the person he's trying to protect, the reputation he's trying to protect is Theo. Um, so at the bottom of page 136, I've highlighted the following. Um, they say that The artist shielded René by claiming it was a suicide attempt. Naifa and Smith summarized the situation, colon, Van Gogh was killed accidentally by a couple of boys and he decided to protect them by, accept, by accept, accepting the blame. On another occasion, they explained that Vincent chose to protect them as a final act of martyrdom. And I find that a really interesting word, uh, martyrdom. What, what is a martyr? It's someone who takes on the sins of someone else or someone who makes some kind of sacrifice and that kind of, in a way, elevates him to sort of a heroic, saintly figure in a way. Um, and then we go on to page 137. But before I do that, I want to show you this, this page. I want to show you this picture here because it's going to come up later on. That is a picture of... Cor van Gogh, that is Vincent's brother, right? And that's going to come up when we deal with those five issues. The reason I've shown you that picture is to show you that that is exactly the same picture as this book. So this is um, a book about Cor van Gogh, Vincent's brother, right? 
we're going to come back to this in a, in a moment. So on page 137, I'm kind of skipping through all the, I don't want to say nonsense, but all of the stuff about Nifa and Smith in terms of the accidental shooting, all the stuff about Renee Secretan. Um, uh, sort of midway through page 137, quote, the clearest evidence about the shooting might be forensic evidence about the wound. If the gun had been fired very close to the body, then this would be strongly suggestive of suicide, although not absolutely conclusive. And so um, there is actually a report that was uh, asked, uh, that was uh, requested by Nifa and Smith, and because there's a description of the wound and so on, we do actually have some forensic evidence of the type of uh, um, of the ballistics and the, the distance that the gun was away from Van Gogh's skin when it was fired. Um, I'm not going to deal with that here, but there is actually a report that Knife and Smith um, got from like a professional, um, I think it was a pathologist. And anyway, they ruled that that it wasn't fired very close to the skin. That was the assessment. Um, at the bottom of page 137, I've highlighted the following. Um, Dr. Masri has left no medical records, seemingly no account at all of his contact with Van Gogh. Uh, unfortunately, and this the part I've highlighted, unfortunately, none of Dr. Gachet's original medical records survive either and he seems to have given out no detailed information on the artist during his lifetime. And so, again, it's kind of like, Dr. Gachet, you, you were there, you took all of his paintings, you cried, you sobbed at his funeral, you um, sketched his picture three times, you, your family went on to, like, make these massive disclosures to like museums and your house is now a museum itself, but, but wow, you gave out no detailed information on the artist during your lifetime. And then there's also the portrait of Dr. Gachet that's the most expensive Van Gogh ever. And yet you gave out no detailed information on the artist during his lifetime. When, when they say during his lifetime, they're talking about during Dr. Gachet's lifetime. Dr. Gachet continued to live um, many, many years after Van Gogh died. I, I don't know if it was 40 years or 50 years, but um, I think he lived to something like 89 or 80 or something. So he had a long, long time to say stuff and didn't seem to say very much. And then the part that's really interesting yeah, is the very next sentence. And we're going to deal with this part uh, Stephanie and I in a separate live stream, we were going to talk only about Dr. Gachet and his son and say, wow, it's quite interesting that they said this subsequently and this subsequently and this subsequently. Um, but anyway, the next sentence is, what we do have is material from his son, Gachet Jr. So doc Dr. Gachet himself doesn't seem to say much about what happened, but his son has got a terrific amount to say. Somebody else who doesn't say much about it, of course, is Marguerite Gachet. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll put like a question mark next to that. This whole thing of, why did Dr. Gachet not provide original medical records when there was so much interest in what was going on? Um, I mean, it was in the newspaper. Um, now we're on page 138, we just got Two more pages, then we are at the five, the five points that Bailey makes to, to, to make his case. So there's not much on page 138. I've highlighted just that in 1928, um, Dr. Edgar Leroy interviewed Gachet Jr. at length. So as early as 1928, someone was getting the Van Gogh story, but guess through who? Not through the reviews not through Theo or Joe, but through Dr. Gachet's son. 
and seemingly not even through Dr. Geshe himself. Um, now I'm skipping ahead and it says here something about um, a local historian um, believes that the gun was fired from extremely close range, less than three centimeters. Um, I'm just going to read this part, quote, the inner purplish ring would have been caused by the bullet's impact and the brown one by powder burns. The existence of a powder burn suggests there was no clothing in the way since a shirt would have trapped much of the powder. So the gun may have been fired beneath the shirt. Now, what I find really interesting with that is um, either, so if Van Gogh shot himself, he lifted up his shirt and then he, you know, so he, he, had, he had the presence of mind to lift his shirt up and then he still fired at this really weird angle, right? That's the one scenario. But the other, as Stephanie says, the other scenario that's definitely quite interesting is like, or he didn't lift up his shirt and, and he, maybe he wasn't even wearing a shirt or his shirt was sort of unbuttoned and opened and maybe he was sort of in a state of semi-undress when either someone shot at him or whatever. So just something to bear that in mind. Um, it's not as though, from what I understand, it's not as though the bullet penetrated his shirt and then through his skin. It simply went through his skin. Um, and so already here the, there's kind of a discrepancy, a kind of a mismatch. You've got one expert, and you have this constantly with Van Gogh, whether it's dealing with fakes or or the gun that they found that is definitely the gun that he used. You constantly have this with Van Gogh. So you've got one group of experts saying, this is absolutely genuine, this is what this is this is authentic, and somebody else saying, No, 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 this is absolutely genuine. So in terms of the bullet wound, you've got one expert saying it definitely wasn't fired from close by because there aren't any powder burns. And then you've got another one saying they definitely were. And so another interesting thing with interesting thing with Dr. Gachet is he draws Vincent's face, but he doesn't draw the wound. And I want to draw a comparison there between Dr. Gachet, who's a medical doctor, he's a military doctor, and Dr. Peyron, who actually drew a sketch of Van Gogh's ear, just in terms of this part of his face. He didn't draw like a portrait of Van Gogh's face. He just drew the side of his face and then he showed how much of the ear was cut off. And I think all that was left was like a small part of the earlobe. So here you have another doctor where the doctor's going, okay, this is the situation, right? This is the kind of medical situation. And now you've got Dr. Gachet who's, who's directly on hand and instead of drawing the wound what does he draw he draws his face um the other thing and I, it could be you could you could argue with me for being a bit too hard on dr gachet but when anyone conducts an autopsy when any pathologist or coroner conducts an autopsy they have a sketch on hand where they say okay um at, at this part, um, there's, there was this is a contusion over here. There's this and over there. In other words, in modern um, autopsies, there's always a, a little bit of um, using, um, you know, a pen and and noting almost like a drawing that this is where something happened. I'm talking about in in, in autopsies dealing with crimes, right? And it is something that is absolutely standard. So, yeah, you've got an artist in Dr. Gachet, who's also a military doctor, who's right there. And so instead of drawing that, he draws Van Gogh's face and he keeps drawing his face. And he's a guy who conducts autopsies. Then we go down to uh, the bottom of page 138, and it refers to De Meyer, who says that the most important point is what appears to have been missing from Van Gogh's wound. The black powder used in late 19th century cartridges was very dirty and would have left suit around the wound if it had been 
fired within 50 centimeters of the body. So here he's referring to Nifan Smith's expert, and it's a very valid argument. He's saying the type of weapon that was used in those days, and it comes up a little bit in the Alec Baldwin incident, because he was also using a legacy weapon, right? And uh, there was there was also quite a lot of um, uh, ignited powder flying in there, which actually burned some people nearby. But anyway, is citing the knife and Smith witness who's saying, if Van Gogh was shot at close quarters, why does he not have actually any powder burns? Why is his skin not scalded? And um, I've actually seen video from another expert who's, who's literally used the same weapon who shows how this powder, the sort of cloud of powder sort of flies into the air and how it makes very distinctive burn patterns. And then that apparently wasn't the case, right? So at the bottom of page 138, Bailey writes, referring to De Meyer, he says, he therefore concluded that in all medical probability, Van Gogh did not shoot himself. So all I'm saying is even Bailey is citing sources that are saying he didn't commit suicide. He's citing some sources that are saying he did, and he's citing some sources saying that he didn't. All I'm saying is that there's some expertise, even based on a art historian's research, that is worth looking at, right? And now we go to page 139, and I've just underlined one little thing here because I want to get to what we need to get to. Um, he writes, quote, the other forensic question to be considered is where the bullet entered the body and the trajectory, since this might indicate whether Van Gogh or another party had pulled the trigger. Now, this is an absolutely central question, and it's absolutely the sort of the seminal question which I believe solves the Brian Laundry mystery. The fact of the trajectory and the fact of um, where the wound exactly took place um, to me proves that Brian Laundry did take his own life, right? The fact that he used his left hand to me is significant, but it's secondary. Um, and so what is really interesting here, and this is the part of underlined, is Gachet Jr., not Dr. Gachet, Gachet Jr., his son, said that the bullet entered near the heart. And so I read that and I'm like, I don't know if that's true, first of all. I don't know if it's true that Van Gogh, the bullet that Van Gogh, that, that entered Van Gogh's body entered near his heart. I don't know if that is actually true, but I do think it's quite interesting that Gachet Jr. is saying that because it's almost like he's saying Van Gogh killed himself and he, when he aimed, he aimed for his heart and he just missed. That seems to be what is being suggested there, which I totally disagree with um, because the trajectory is not like that at all. And if, if you watch Loving Vincent, then you do know you've got it sort of illustrated in a little bit of a way what that trajectory actually is. Of course, the fact that uh, Dr. Gesher either didn't do an autopsy or if he did, we don't know about it, um, that helps conceal the trajectory. And it doesn't really matter what the, tra the trajectory is. It sounds like a reckless thing to say. The fact that Van Gogh took 30 hours to die tells you that it must have missed most of his major organs, so it wasn't a very effective um, self-inflicted wound, if that was what it was supposed to be. Cotton Star, good to see you here, and also, thanks for that, and also, I got your email. Let me know what the ultimate result is of the question I asked. I'm still, still not quite sure what, what um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Gathering places, that, that's a terrible death. Nisi says his trajectory is a bit off, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, definitely a bit, a bit off. Hey, jealousy says, makes no sense. 
Uh, Cotton Star asks, anything definitive on why sketched Van Gogh with no beard? Well, <laughs> that was asked last yesterday. Um, and what I said to Stephanie is, well, it's possible that he shaved. It's possible that he actually went out kind of on a date or he had dinner that night and he was actually grooming himself and kind of just being a bit more presentable. Van Gogh actually has self-portraits of himself where he has no hair on the top of his head or a beard. In other words, he's sort of um, completely shaved. I think there are at least two self-portraits where he looks that way. It could also be that um, Dr. Gachet is such a crappy artist that he didn't know how to or didn't depict the beard. That's also possible. Um, these are some of the newspaper reports from that time. And that then brings us to... These are the five, um, this, these are the beginning of the five um, uh, uh, Bailey's reasoning of, of sort of five reasons why he feels it's definitely suicide. So I'm going to take you guys through this. I, I'd love to read it verbatim, but uh, out of respect for the author, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he wants you to buy his book. I'm going to touch on it very lightly, um, and then um, then I'm going to interrogate it. In other words, then I'm going to – so I'm first going to go through them, and then I'm going to um, – so I'm going to leave it to you to, to decide, oh, that actually makes sense. I think he did actually do this or that or whatever. So, and then, then I'm going to go through it and give it the TCRS treatment. And the, the test is, first of all, what do you think based on an art historian's assessment, which is well-informed, it's educated, it's factual, it's based on very good information, right? So what do you think based on this educated position? And then I'm going to go through it with some of my information and you can then decide, mm, I, I'm going to stick with the art dude. Uh, you know, he's, I'm, I'm, I'm with him. Or you might say, well, wow, you've, you've actually got a point. I think we should call the Van Gogh Museum right now and also the New York Times. This is big. You know, the world has been deceived for 132 years, whatever. So, so here we go. So as I say, as I go through these, these are five of his reasons. I'm going to touch on it very lightly, but I'm also not going to interpret it. I'm just going to give it to you sort of straight. So, so we're on 100 page, page 140 of Van Gogh's finale by um, Martin Bailey. And his number one reason is the first reason he gives for why Van Gogh committed suicide is suicidal tendencies. He's saying that Van Gogh was a suicidal guy. Um, I'm going to just read what he says here. He says, quote, Van Gogh had suffered a recent history of severe self-harm. In December 1888, just 19 months before his death, he cut off much of his left ear. Although it is unclear whether this was a suicide attempt, his life was certainly in danger. Skipping a bit further forward, um, he quotes a letter that he wrote to Theo, I think three months later, where he said something like, I would have preferred to die. So he, he wrote this to Theo after what happened to his ear, saying, I would have preferred to die than to cause and bear so much trouble. Then I'm not going to go through, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really worth reading this entire piece, but um, I'm going to jump to near the end where he refers to Dr. Peyron saying that um, Vincent's recovering 
and at the asylum and also that his ideas of suicide have disappeared. So, so Dr. Peyron even seems to be referencing that, that he was suicidal. Then he also refers to Dr. Peyron's medical notes. Again, it's interesting that Dr. Gache doesn't have, seem to have medical notes on his own patient. Anyway, it says, when departing from the asylum in May 1890, Dr. Peyron wrote about his patient Van Gogh, quote, on several occasions, he has attempted to poison himself, either by swallowing colors that he used for painting or by ingesting paraffin. Um, and, and then Bailey talks about these episodes of him trying to, you could either say trying to commit suicide or trying to poison himself or whatever he was doing. This is witnessed by two different people, sister, a, a, a nun, I guess, and also someone called Jean-Francois Paulet. So they, they know about this. And then Bailey writes, so this is obviously his position. He says, this string of, it, this string of incidents is basically demonstrative that Van Gogh undoubtedly had a strong inclination towards self-harm. Right? So, so um, Bailey's making the point that there's a precedent that Van Gogh was kind of um, habitually hurting himself, habitually thinking about suicide or whatever. And then he... also says that uh, he seriously considered ending his life on a number of con uh, on a number of occasions so that's that's the slightly watered down version of the suicidal tendency so that's number one number two is he now sort of conflates van gogh's troubled state with other family members so he basically says um, his brother Cor um, and his sister Vil, for Villamin, um, they also were, so in other words, there's like a history of, of mental illness, if you want to use that term. There's a history of instability or depression in the Van Gogh family. And, um, and then he refers to I'm quoting from the first, the top line on page 141. He says, of Vincent's four siblings, two suffered severe mental illness. And then he says, Cor, the youngest brother, so there, there were three brothers, Vincent, Theo, and Cor. Cor was the youngest brother. Cor, the youngest, took his own life. That's a fact. That is an absolute undisputed fact. So whether you say, I don't know whether Vincent van Gogh committed suicide or he was murdered while well, his brother definitely committed suicide. And so this is quite a good argument. He's saying, um, well, so we may not know the circumstances of Van Gogh's death, but his brother committed suicide. So why not Van Gogh? You know, it's almost like does it run in the family? Um So I'm not going to say anything further about that in terms of just the first reading. Then now he goes to Theo's problems. Now, so he's spoken about a brother and sister now is dealing with Theo's problems, which in a sense you could say really belongs in the above category because it's like the family's, um, you know, mental illness or whatever. Anyway, so... Middle of page 141, he talks about Theo's problems, and he says, during the first half of July 1890, meaning, remember that Van Gogh died in the, at the very end of July. So in the first, I wouldn't even say the first half, I would say the first days of July, um, there was a, it was a troubling, disturbing time for Theo. I wouldn't even say that. I would say it was a disturbing time for Theo, for his wife, for the family, for that little family, and and the that disturbing 
the disturbance disturbed Vincent, that disturbance affected Vincent, that those troubles became Vincent's troubles. And um, so that's that. Um, I think this is quite a good point to emphasize. Bailey writes, inexplicably, Theo didn't tell Vincent that that it sort of, um, so he was kind of arguing with his bosses and he was about to leave his job and all sorts of things. And Bailey writes, inexplicably, Theo failed to tell Vincent about this. The fact that that he'd actually made, he'd negotiated with his bosses and it had been sorted out, right? And then his final point on this is he says, on July 23rd, Vincent wrote, this is about a week before his death, Vincent wrote with concern about the storms that he feared were threatening his brother's household. So, this, I'm quite surprised he doesn't mention this first, but he, he uh, in terms of his five points. Um, but he's basically saying that even in Vincent's own words, on the 23rd of July, he wrote a letter saying that he was feeling the storms that were affecting his brother, and then he even painted those paintings. Um, and so that was obviously affecting him and... and um, affecting his state of mind and affecting, you know, him in a major way, in a significant way. Um, that that then brings us to the. Um, just want to make sure it's one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So so this is the fourth reason Bailey gives for um, why he believes it's a suicide, I, I I might actually also put this as number one. I would either put the troubles with Theo as number one or Vincent's last words as number one. Anyway, he writes that um, basically that Vincent van Gogh himself said that he committed suicide. And when I wrote my book, I kind of thought, so I didn't intend to write a book called The Murder of Vincent Van Gogh. I was just writing a book testing some of the theories, and I thought I thought I could possibly disprove that he was mentally ill, and I thought I could, because he had syphilis, and I also thought I could disprove, um, I, I thought there was a chance that I could disprove that he cut off his own ear. And... And then I thought, I probably am not going to be able to prove, disprove the suicide. And and then something completely different, something completely unexpected happened as I investigated it. Um, but anyway, to come back to Bailey, so anyway, for me, the major hurdle was how on earth to explain that Van Gogh said I committed suicide if he didn't. That before I'd, I'd kind of gotten anywhere near that, I was like, that's an insurmountable hurdle. And also I thought, even if you try and even if you like were a defense lawyer and you, you're trying to, you know, pull a rabbit out of a hat, this is going to be a very, this is almost like an impossible thing to get around, right? So this is very, very strong reinforcement for that, that particular theory. So... Um, Bailey doesn't really spend a lot of time on Vincent's last words. He says something like, um, he says, when Vincent lay dying, Dr. Gachet tried to comfort him and also said that, that he wanted to save his life. Vincent responded that, well, then I'll have to do it all over again, right? Um, just give me a moment. I just want to check the source for that. I 
56 right there. Okay, um, so then the, the other thing that he says is that Theo, who sat by his side, Bernard to Aurier, yes, um, Theo, who sat by his side, said, um, told his sister he himself wanted to die, right? So you've got this from a really intimate source, a very, you'd think, reliable source, um, his own brother saying, you know what, he, he actually wanted to die. And that's very hard to argue with. Uh, why on earth would his brother not be honest about that? Um, right? He goes on to say, Theo was fully convinced that the shooting was suicide. He, he sort of says the same thing again a bit later. He says, if Theo had even the slightest doubt that it that it was suicide, in other words, if Theo thought it was murder, he would have just he would have just he would have done something. He would have um, had it investigated. He would not have let the matter drop. Um, um, yeah. So I think I'm not going to take it further than that. Then we come to the last point, which is not a bad one. He says, everyone at the time believed it was suicide. Um, so it says here, Vincent's artist friends who attended the funeral accepted his death as suicide. So he's kind of just making the case that it was generally believe that he committed suicide, so why, why wasn't it? Um, he goes on to say that, um, I'm just trying to look at the source for number 54. Also Bernard de Aurier, but he, he basically says, so Bernard, his, his friend Bernard says, his suicide was absolutely calculated and undertaken with total lucidity. So that is um, Bernard's assessment. And then the final thing that, I, that I've highlighted here is well, let me just quote here. Another witness to the death was Hershig, right? The I think his name is Anton Hershig, who, who in 1911 recorded what his friend Vincent told him. And so Hershig says, I wounded myself in the field. I fired the pistol. And that is 57. Let's just have a look at the source for that. So... That is from Hershig as well. So Van Gogh apparently also told Hershig, I wounded myself in the field, right? Then the final word on this, and this is from page 144, um, Vincent's feeling of loneliness in the final months um, that preyed on his mind. So, so basically, uh, Bailey's saying that um, this incredible loneliness is really what pushed him over the edge. Um, he also make, he uses this quote. He says, The feeling of loneliness takes hold of me in the fields in such a fearsome way that I hesitate to go out. And then the very last um, words in this chapter um, or kind of Theo's assessment, basically saying he was lonely and sometimes it was more than he could bear, right? So that's really Theo's assessment that why did he commit suicide? Well, because he was lonely and he just couldn't bear it anymore, right? 
And I think that's, that's a C62. That's, that was a letter from Theo to Joe the very next day. So, well, it was actually not even the very next day. It was, it was this letter apparently was written 28th of July when Gogh died um, the 20, was it the 29th of July? So this was written while he was actually dying, I guess, this letter. <clears throat> I might need to take another lozenge, my throat really is not coping. Stephanie says, Bernard, to Aurea, Bernard was at the funeral but not present at the inn. It's quite weird that because the funeral was sort of at the inn, but I guess he was at the graveside. Difficult to know exactly what that means. Yvonne asks, who reported the quote, then I'll have to do it all over again. I think I know the answer, but I just want to make sure. Forty-six, footnote forty-six. So it says, as Vincent lay dying, Doctor Gachet tried to comfort him by saying that he hoped to save his life. Vincent responded to Doctor Gachet. So, in other words, Doctor Gachet is saying, "I want to save you. I want to save you." Vincent says, "But if you do, then I'm going to have to do it all over again." So the source for that. Number 46 is Bernard to Aurier. But obviously that must have been conveyed by Dr. Gachet. So before I go through those um, arguments, um, let's hear, are there any of you who are sort of going, hmm, I actually think it was suicide. Are there any of you that are sort of, because I, I find some of those arguments really persuasive. It's not like he's only got one argument. He's got Vincent's own words, um, not only his own spoken words, but his own written words. He's got family members that are also suffering from mental illness. Um, everybody, it's not like um, a few people thought he committed suicide and, and there was this perception that something else happened. Everybody seemed to think the same thing. So why why, why didn't they? Um, but are, are there any of you here that are like, I'm actually, I, I think, I think it, it was actually suicide. So... Corporal Deb says, I still think it is suicide. Okay, thanks for that. Sharon says, how are you feeling? I'm, my, my rib is actually less of a problem than my sore throat. My, my throat's really sore. It's, it's just from being really run down. You know, it's from, I mean, I'm sleeping okay now, but in the early days, I just could not sleep with the pain that I was in. So in terms of the poll, we're at a third of you think that it was suicide and over around about two thirds still think that it was murder.
Corporal Deb says, have you tested for COVID? Um, it's not a sore throat in terms of a cough sore throat. It's a sore throat. I don't know whether I ate um, crisps or something, but I think I actually literally wounded my the backside of my throat um, where, where I think a chip that wasn't properly crunched sort of cut 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 it slightly so it's sort of a, a wound that is um that is hurting at the back it's not really it's not like a cough sore throat it's not a it's not that gathering place thanks a lot wow I, um seems like when i i really appreciate um really appreciate that gathering place thanks a lot actually um, makes me smile. Um, Nisi says, murder due to syphilis, Dr. Gachet. Cotton Star says, that injury takes a while to heal. Yeah, it certainly does. I've been doing everything. I've been using mouthwash. I've been using an antiseptic spray. I've been brushing my teeth a lot. I've been trying not to eat a lot just so that my mouth is clean. I've been drinking a lot of water. I've been taking these lozenges. Um, still really painful. I, I don't know whether my body is sort of sending all of its armies to sort out my rib. But, um, you know, and I've, I've put off the exercise that I want to do, you know, walking on the treadmill when I'm watching the news and, and swimming, but just kicking. I'm not doing any exercise just so that all my resources are available for healing. It's just frustrating that with as much that I'm going through, I've got to deal with this throat. But as I said, I think my the exhaustion of the three days and the fact that I just could not sleep for quite a long time after just totally ran my immunity into the ground, I think. Yvonne says, you have to stop hurting yourself. Stephanie says, gathering place, thank you for your generosity and your thoughtfulness. Yes, definitely. Thanks a lot for that. Okay, are you guys ready? So before we, before we go through the TCRS analysis, Let's do a quick vote, just so that it's explicit. Everyone who's here, everyone who's in chat, um, do you think Van Gogh committed suicide, yes or no? I know that, um, I know that Corporal Deb thinks yes, so, but, but still vote. But I just want to, so Corporal Deb says yes. Let's see if there are any other yeses. Robbie Robin says no. Margaret Zabinski says no. Nisi says no. Stephanie says no. Sharon says no. Susan Becker says no. Anyone else think yes, that it is suicide? Patty says no. Yvonne says I have to say no. Stephanie says there are others that voted yes, that, but they made me just not in chat. I, I've just seen it's gone up to 32% saying that it committed suicide. Hey, Jealousy says yes. So, wow, so we've got two people saying, saying yes that are in chat. SM Kovalinsky says no. Cotton Star says most likely no. Thanks for that. So um, I wish there were more of you saying yes because what I want to see, and I mean I'm putting myself on the line here, is I'm not going to take you through my analysis of it. I know um, 
Corporal Deb, I don't know if Corporal Deb's been watching since the beginning. I don't know how much of the analysis you followed. But the question is, am I able to convince you otherwise, right? And it's possible that no matter what I say, I won't be able to convince you otherwise, but it's also possible that maybe I can. So the, the question is, the test is, and it's also to hate jealousy, um, can I change your yes to a no? Um, as I said, it's unfortunate that there are not more yeses because it's, it's, it's sort of quite difficult on a scale of just two or three people. Um, Corporal Deb says she's watched almost all of it. Okay, so I'm not, not sure you are going to change your mind. Um, anyway, so yeah, it goes. So um, on page 140, Bailey talks about um, Van Gogh having suicidal tendencies. And without even looking at this, I've kind of got two or three major counter arguments. The one major counter argument is, did he have any suicidal tendencies during the last two months of his life? Meaning, was he showing any signs of being depressed, of being unstable, being angry, uh, drinking? Um, was there any signs of self-harm um, during the last two months of his life? Was there signs of his motivation flagging? Was there signs of him being emotional, overly emotional or overwhelmed for some reason? And so that's just one aspect. The other aspect you want to look at is what did his medical doctor, what did his own doctor say about his prognosis during the last two months of his life? And you could definitely argue that um, whatever Dr. Gachet says you want to treat with a grain of salt, whether it's uh, whatever it is, but in terms of this, Dr. Gachet himself said, basically is cured. He basically said to his brother, I don't see this recurring. Uh, he seems to be in the clear, whoopity do all that kind of thing. So even um, a doctor assessed Van Gogh um, within about a month of his death that everything was fine, right? Um, uh, another thing that you could say is that Van Gogh himself assessed his mental health by writing to Dr. Peyron, I think he did, but also in his own self-assessments to his brother and to other family members, he was saying how invigorating the countryside was, he was saying how happy he was. If you followed how I went through this book, if you followed um, episode by episode, almost every single chapter Bailey was emphasizing what a great time Van Gogh was having, how happy he was, that he was inspired, that he was optimistic, that he was positive. You kind of had chapter after chapter after chapter, page after page after page of Van Gogh having a good experience here, an, aff an affirmative experience here, um, that he was um, um, motivated, happy, enjoying himself, liking his surroundings, in a better place, all those kind of things. And um, I also made the argument where I said, if Van Gogh was suicidal, why does he not commit suicide in the asylum when he's all alone? Why does he commit? Why does he not commit suicide just after he's cut off his ear, he's all alone, he's kind of abandoned by his family, he doesn't really have any friends, he's in this miserable place surrounded by sick people. Um, if he's suicidal, why not commit suicide then? Um, he also spoke of struggling with his motivation then, where he said, you know, sometimes I go out in the fields and I'm so overwhelmed, I feel so lonely. Why didn't he commit suicide then? So um, what, what I said very early on was I said, I could understand if he left Auvers and he went to saint Rami. So in other words, it's the opposite. He left Auvers, he went to saint Rami, and then he committed suicide. That would make complete sense. But why on earth would you dig yourself out of the hole that you're in, go somewhere else that's much nicer, your family's there and they visit you, your friends are there and they visit you, you pick up your motivation, you're painting like a machine, and then out of nowhere, and Bailey himself admits this. It's like 
everything is great and then one day just suddenly for no apparent reason just commit suicide. It's like, um, and the other aspect to that is he paints 70 paintings in 70 days. So there's not like a dip. It's not like he goes through a depression. It's not like there's a major crisis. He paints every single day and even at his funeral, the paint is still wet kind of on the walls. He's still painting. Now, um, if you're not an artist, if you're not a creative person, also if you're not a very prolific person, you're not a very busy person, you might think, I don't see anything wrong with somebody who's busy and then they commit suicide, right? Um, I can tell you as an artist, uh, I can tell you as someone who's injured right now, someone who's got a broken rib not right now and that's dealing with a little bit of emotional instability, that... I'm having difficulty being prolific and um, motivated, right? Um, th those creative juices aren't really flowing because I'm a bit disappointed and I'm a bit um, unhappy. You could, and, and I've even said to someone, I'm starting to feel depressed. You know, it's like I put all of this effort into my training and now it's wasted and I've got to start from scratch and so on, right? And so um, my creativity has been interrupted because my motivation's been interrupted. My motivation's been interrupted because I've, I'm in a, not a crisis, but I'm in a situation that is um, kind of a shock and a, a trauma, right? And so has it happened to Van Gogh? Did something happen to him that that shocked him, that that traumatized him, that upset his motivation? And the answer seems to be no, because he painted, he kept painting. He was able to go out and paint every single day. So where do you have the window where suddenly is suicidal? Or is it suddenly I'm suicidal? And if you don't accept that argument, you say, well, what about Brian Laundrie? Brian Laundrie one day was smiling during the Moab incident. The next he committed suicide. Not true. Um, uh, Gabby Petito was murdered August 27th, somewhere around there. And Brian Laundrie likely died about two weeks later. So, you know, you can't make the argument that he murdered her. He felt if he felt so bad about it, he would have killed himself the next day. The the full import of that, the full um, um, you know, the, the full scale and scope of that devastating um, reality took a while to really overwhelm him. You know, the the, the full. Um, size of that monster um, took a while to sort of over, overtake him, and that, that does happen. Um, in the same way with when I hurt my rib, um, immediately after it happened, I was really willing to get on my bike again. I was willing, to, I was ready to continue. Well, the, the full realization of what had happened hadn't quite occurred to me by then. I, I wasn't quite aware of what the level of damage was, right? And so what is the thing that was so damaging to Vincent van Gogh? And you might say he was lonely. He, he was lonely kind of his whole life. He was, he lived in England. He was here and there, you know. Um, you could say, um, you know, um, he was lonely, lonely. Well, so he didn't really have a girlfriend or a wife his whole life. So what is different in Auvers? Um you could say that he struggled. He was struggling when he was in Auvers. You know, he hadn't sold an, a, a, an artwork. That was true for his whole life. N nothing was fundamentally different in Auvers. In fact, it's the opposite. He was actually doing better. It had a positive review. It actually sold a painting fairly recently. Um, he was really on the ball. It's the opposite to all of what is mentioned here. Um, so... So to, to interrogate what Bailey's written here is he says, this is the first sentence he writes under suicidal tendencies. He says, Van Gogh had suffered a recent history of severe self-harm. In, in December 1888, and that's where I sort of cut it off, and I say, 
How can you say that what happened in December 1888, so he supposedly committed suicide in July, end of July 1890, how can you say that that's a recent history of self-harm? I would say a recent history of self-harm is June and July 1890. In other words, the days and weeks preceding his suicide. In other words, in the days and weeks preceding his suicide, why isn't he drinking? Why isn't he eating his paint? Why isn't he whatever, right? Why, is, why doesn't he just stop painting? Why doesn't he write a letter saying, I'm not very happy? Let me say that again. Why doesn't this really expressive artist write a single letter to his family he's writing to constantly and say, I'm not really very happy. I'm not coping. I'm miserable. I'm a failure. I'm this, I'm that. Instead, his letters are exactly the opposite. I'm inspired. This is so beautiful. I painted this and it was so lovely. I'm going to paint that again. I'm going to paint Dr. Gachet's daughter. All of these ideas that he wants for the future. And the very last thing that he does is he writes letters saying, I need more paint. I need more canvases. So where on earth is this thing of like, I'm not very happy. I don't want to continue living, right? Um, also, where he says... He had a recent history of severe self-harm. Um, that is if you accept that he cut off his own ear, right? And I realize this isn't the ambit of this narrative, and I haven't really gone to the trouble to deal with that in detail, but I don't believe that Van Gogh cut off his ear either. And you might say, but that is getting ridiculous now. Obviously, he cut off his own ear. Um just in short, first of all, um, in the history of self-harm, just as in the history of suicide, if you know true crime, if you know about this, if you know the statistics, almost nobody in the history of suicide shoots themselves in the sort of lower abdomen. Almost nobody. Um, it's, you know, whatever the percentage is, 70%, 80%, 90% is to the temple, and if not to the temple, to the center of the chest where your heart is, right? But nobody shoots himself kind of in the temple and then they die 30 hours later. Nobody does that. In terms of the history of self-harm, people never cut off their ears. They might um, cut their, um, their wrists or, or cut, their, cut themselves somewhere else, but they don't tend to cut their faces or, or cut their, their ears. Um, if you tried to research this, you'd also see that it's excruciatingly difficult to get through because there are all of these arteries and, and it would be difficult to actually pull it off. Um, um, excuse the pun. It would be actually difficult to, to cut your ear off with all the blood there and still hold your ear and be able to get through it. It would just be a difficult operation surgically to, to do yourself. It would be difficult to execute, right? Um, and once again, if you say he didn't cut off his own ear, you would just say, well, then what happened? Well, there was someone that he was arguing with constantly in the yellow house, and that was Paul Gogar. As soon as his ear was cut off, Paul Gogar immediately left. Why didn't Paul Gogar attend to him? He was his friend. Why didn't he comfort him? Why didn't he support him? And also, why did he leave his swords behind? And why did he send a letter later saying, can you send me my swords, right? Um, I'm also not the only person to, to suggest that his ear was sliced off with a sword uh, instead of him cutting it off. I'm not the only person saying that. Um, it has been um, uh, conjectured before as well. But my point is, if he did cut off his own ear and he was suicidal, why on earth doesn't he then commit suicide in the asylum? And that's the other point, is if Van Gogh is so miserable and so, what's the word, um, such a failure and so defeated, why does he take responsibility and sort of sign himself up to, to go to an asylum? What I'm trying to say is somebody is losing the battle to look after themselves. They're losing the battle to of like, I want to live, losing their motivation, losing 
perspective, all, all these different things, they, 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 they're not sane anymore, they're mentally unstable. What kind of person that's mentally unstable and depressed says, you know what, I'm going to actually admit myself to an asylum. If you know people that are depressed, um, and I'm not, I'm certainly not saying this is true of every single person, but a lot of people who are depressed resist treatment, resist going to psychologists, um, resist all of those kind of interventions. I'm not saying um, through the entire course that, that they may act that way. I'm just saying um, that you, you may not um, sort of put your hand up in the, in the state of um, crisis where you don't have clarity about your own life and go, oh, I really need treatment right now, right? You're not going to just suddenly snap out of your delirious state and be like, oh, I need treatment, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to volunteer for that. Nobody's got to convince me to go. I will just go myself. And then he stays there voluntarily for about a year. He stays in the asylum for about a year. So um, so when Bailey says he had a recent history of self-harm, well, he didn't have a recent history in June or July. And even in the months preceding that, in order to be released from the asylum, the doctors there had to be convinced and had to be sure that he was on the road to recovery. So when exactly is this recent history of problems starting and ending? In, in fact, the opposite is true. Van Gogh didn't have a recent history of self-harm, meaning whatever had happened in the past, in the period preceding his death, he was actually doing pretty well. He wasn't drinking. Adeline Revue said he didn't touch a drop of alcohol. Um, he was healthy enough to go and paint every single day. He seemed to be in a good routine where he would get up, uh, <clears throat> get up, have breakfast, go out and paint, finish the painting that day, write a letter to his brother, um, have dinner, go to sleep that night, and repeat this for 70 days in a row. In the midst of all of this, he was making good relationships. He, he met Dr. Gachet, he met Dr. Gachet's daughter, he met the innkeeper and those folk. He went to visit his brother, his brother came to visit him, etc., etc. Um so it's interesting that where, where Bailey cites suicidal tendencies, he's got to go way back to December 1888. Also where he talks about Vincent saying, so this is his quote, he says, Vincent wrote to Theo to say, I would have preferred to die than to cause and bear so much trouble. Okay, but the problem is he wrote that also in that period. Van Gogh didn't write... I would have preferred to die when he was in Auvers. He never wrote those words when he was in Auvers, right? And that, in a way, is giving you a clue to Vincent van Gogh's character as a sort of martyr figure. So what he's saying here is, I would have preferred to die than to cause and bear so much trouble. He's saying, I don't want to cause a lot of trouble. He's saying, I don't want to be a burden to somebody else. And so here's a situation that maybe somebody did shoot him, right? And maybe he realizes it was his fault or he shouldn't have done something, or he's now propelling his brother into a situation that he doesn't want his brother to face. And so he's saying, it's me, blame me, don't blame somebody else. I don't want what I've done to be a burden to you. I've been such a burden to you already, right? In other words, it's the same tactic after the ear incident, after the suicide incident. And so, again, you'd say, why on earth would you just not say, Theo, Gorgar cut off my ear? Because Theo had a business relationship with Gorgar. Because Theo was also supporting Vincent. So Theo, Vincent needed Theo to be on good terms with Vincent. And so in order for that to happen, if Vincent was not on good terms with a particular person, he nevertheless still needed his brother to be on good terms with that particular person, right? So what this is getting to is 
do you really know what kind of person Vincent van Gogh is? Do you really know his psychology? Do you really know how he thinks, how he operates, and the kind of way that he responds to, to things? Or do you just really look at his paintings and know, okay, well, that's quite a nice color? In other words, how deeply do you actually know the identity, the true identity of this person, right? And that is the area where I'm just seeing a lot of um, shallowness in our society. The movies that are coming out right now, um, a recent one was the, the Matrix 4, another one was the Batman, where the people making these movies are unable to actually, um, uh, what's the word, um, not conjure, but just get a sense of the character of the person that they focused on. Because we've become such such a superficial society, we can look at something over and over and over again and still have a very, very shallow appreciation of who a person really is, and not just of who a person really is, of who, who we are. If, if your appreciation of another person is really shallow, it might be a reflection, it might be a symptom that your own depth, I don't want to say depth of character, but your own depth of self-knowledge of of your own um, self is more superficial than it perhaps should be. Uh, Dr. Peyron said that, in, and this is in terms of his recovery at the asylum, so bear in mind Van Gogh goes to the asylum kind of ill, broken, destroyed, um, unhappy, uh, dysfunctional, all those things, disappointed in himself, embarrassed, humiliated, um, um, in despair, right? But in order to come out a year later, he needs to have made progress. He needs to have evolved as a person. He needs to have grown. He needs to have improved. He needs to have healed. And so his ear does heal, his mind does heal, his heart does heal, he does paint Starry Night while he's there, he does develop as a human being, he does feel longing, I want to be close to my family, he does feel this sense of urgency that, you know what, I'm going to make another stab at being an artist, I can do this. And so his motivation roars back. It's sort of intermittent in the beginning, but it it, it it gathers momentum. There's a period, I think, of two or three months where he doesn't write to anybody at all, it, and it's where he's struggling. And then during the period um, in Auvers, he writes constantly. He's writing letters constantly. It's almost like status updates. And it's, it's filled with positivity. It's filled with, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm going to come visit. Will you come and visit me? All of that kind of thing. Um, it's in the middle of spring. It's in the middle of summer. It's in a period of warmth and abundance. And he's in this beautiful area. And I've been there myself. It's an area that inspires life energy. It's an area that inspires you to sort of feel alive and joyful and connection and even if and I went there by myself as well even if you're there by yourself it's just, just such a lovely area that you are happy to be there you're happy to be in this beautiful environment there's a river there are these amazing views there are these lovely cottages that are sort of ensconced in nature there's this wonderful almost fairy tale sense of people in this sort of little village, in this sort of farmyard setting that you once read about. It's this wonderful community that is part of nature. And he's there painting it from every conceivable angle. He loves how the houses look. He loves the train passing by. He loves the sweep of the wheat fields. He loves the... Um, uh, the flowers and the the flow of people. So every now and then he paints someone that's walking down the lane. Um, and so there's so much that is invigorating him. There's so much that is bringing him alive. There's so much that is getting his attention. He's not bored. He's not 
um, distracted, is not um, sort of needing to motivate himself, is interested, is is involved, he's in integrating himself also into that community. He's got friends there, right? Um, to go further through suicidal tendencies, Bailey writes, on several occasions he attempted to poison himself by swallowing colors, ingesting paraffin, blah, blah, blah. So you look at that and, again, as a true crime person, you would say, well, then that would be his method of choice. In other words, if in the past the way that he harmed himself was he cut himself or that he ingested stuff, well, then wouldn't he do that again in future? In other words, would he not cut himself again in future or uh, ingest something poisonous because that's, that is what is done in the past. The best predictor of the future is the past. There's absolutely no gun-related anecdote in Vincent's past besides at the moment of his death. There's no moment where he's playing with guns or he's fascinated with guns or he looks at someone's gun or he draws a gun. Um, there's nothing like that. Um, but there is this thing of him poisoning himself um, by swallowing his paint and by ingesting paraffin. And we also know about his abuse of absinthe. So why isn't, you know, so, and all of this happens when he was doing, doing the asylum, right? These episodes were recalled by witnesses at the asylum. So, so why, why is he not doing this when he's in Orvez? Why is he not trying to poison himself? Why is he not drinking excessively? Why is he not swallowing colors or doing anything like that? Where's the dysfunction in Orvez? Where's the self-harm in Orvez? Where's the letter where he says, I'm, I'm uh, tired of living, I'm tired of life, I'm just tired of, of everything. Where's that? And you must bear in mind, Van Gogh is an expressive artist. He is sensitive, he's emotional, he's expressive, he's communicative. He writes a heck of a lot of letters and he fails to say that he's unhappy in his letters. Why? Then uh, Bailey says that Van Gogh, because of these incidents, the string of incidents, Van Gogh undoubtedly had a strong inclination towards self-harm. And so, what, so my counter to that is it wasn't a string of incidents. You can't say a string of incidents happened and then he committed suicide. When the string of incidents happened in the asylum months earlier and the ear incident happened more than almost like a year and a half earlier. You can't, you can't call that a string of incidents. You can't say that happened, then that happened, then that, that happened. You can't say he committed suicide a week after he cut off his ear because he didn't. <laughs> um, and then at the end of this first argument, Bailey himself writes, of course, this does not prove he shot himself. In other words, he's made the case for Van Gogh being suicidal. He's made the case that Van Gogh is doing self-harm and he's suicidal. And, you know, um, I can also put up my hand and say there is an aspect of self-harm here. There is an aspect of self-harm in terms of he did drink excessively when he drank. He did, um, you know, like when he lived with Gorgar, they were sort of rabble rousers. They would go to brothels and stuff. Um, the, the, the whole, if you want to talk about self-harm, I think you should talk about um, the, the, um, the syphilis story. You know, he, he's actually a sick man. He's, he's, he's gotten this STD because of his lifestyle. Talk about that when you want to talk about self-harm. Um, you know, talk about him, his, his sort of lifestyle in terms of kind of the opposite sex. And, but then you must also say, 
did he go to brothels when he was in Orvez? Well, I don't think there is even a brothel in Orvez. Um, did he drink when he was in Orvez? Adeline Revu said he didn't touch a drop of alcohol. That sounds like a guy who said, I'm reformed, I'm going to work hard, I'm motivated, I'm turning over a new leaf. And by all, by all accounts, he did. Susan Smith, thanks a lot for that. So by all accounts, not only, it's not just like Dr. Gachet said he turned a new leaf, Theo thought he was doing a lot better, the innkeeper said that he got up every day and went out and painted. It's also the fact that his archive of work showed that he was um, prolific, he was motivated. So where's the self-harm? Where do you have time for self-harm in the middle of painting 70 paintings in 70 days? Unless he was like biting his nails. Um, he says, Bailey writes, this does not prove he shot himself, but it does demonstrate that ending his life was something that he seriously considered on quite a number of occasions. I don't know what to say about that, except that I don't agree that he was considering ending his life in the last two months of his life, and that's that's what this book's all about. This book is about Van Gogh's finale, not, and yeah, he's talking about suicidal tendencies, now he's got to jump all the way back to December 1888 and the asylum. Where are these suicidal tendencies in his finale in June and July? And if he considered suicide on quite a number of, of occasions, can you tell me that he considered suicide in June and July? When he left the asylum, was it like, I'm really miserable, so I'm going to leave the asylum and, and, and die? Or was it, I'm, I actually want to live, so I'm going to leave the asylum and I'm better now? And then all the doctors say, yes, you are better. And the doctor that he goes to in Orvez also says, well, you're doing really well, keep working. And he does keep working. So that's suicidal tendencies. And um, you can decide for yourself. Um, let's, just, let's just do a quick poll only of Corporal Deb and of Hey Jealousy. Do you think I've made a good argument just in terms of that particular argument? Just in terms of taking what... Bailey's written about that. Do you think I've made a good argument in terms of challenging that? This is that's directed to okay, thanks for, for that, Corporal Deb. So that's on one of the five, right? Let's see how well I do on the others. Hey, jealousy, what's your opinion? Do you think I've made a a good argument there? Thank you. Okay, so two yeses. And that's on the first point. I've got four more to go through. Let's see how well I do with those. By the way, we're on exactly 70% saying was murdered now, 30% suicide, and there's 102 votes at this point. So we had quite a few votes now. So now we're going to where he associates the family. He says, cause death and world's depression. He's kind of saying, you know what, you don't even need to look at Van Gogh. If you look at his family members, they were also struggling with mental illness. And so I think you can see from a mile away that um, that that it's definitely possible, that it's definitely plausible. And, and here I've got to concede, I've got to concede that he's got a really good point because it's a fact that Vincent Van Gogh's brother did commit suicide. It's a fact. And so you could definitely make the very simplistic argument. You could say, Van Gogh's younger brother committed suicide. What's the big deal that that Van Gogh himself didn't commit suicide, right? And so on page 141, um, he writes, it's not a very long thing dealing with this, but he, he writes about... Kor van Gogh taking his own life. And then he says the following, quote, little is known about the circumstances or the problems he had encountered, but it was classified as suicide, right? Let me read that again. Little is known about the circumstances or the problems he had, meaning Kor van Gogh, 
He's saying little is known about what happened, but Cor van Gogh's death was classified as a suicide. He goes on to say Cor's death certificate gave the cause of death as an accident during his illness. So in a weird way, Cor's official cause of death is actually given as an accident. It's not actually not suicide. So in a in a weird way, you could you could actually say, oh, wow, we now have another investigation as, as as the true crime community. We've got now got another job to do. We've actually got to check whether it was Cor's death suicide or not, because his official cause of death here is given as an accident, right? And I think they said here in brackets fever, right? So on his death certificate, it says an accident during his illness, right? Then it goes on to say a Red Cross register of war deaths was more explicit, recording that during fever took his own life. So again, you've got... A discrepancy here, you've got one source saying, in other words, on his own death certificate, saying that he died of an accident during his illness. Then you have another um, uh, registrar saying he had a fever and took his own life, right? Hey, Jealous, he says the sadness is overwhelming, it certainly is. Corporal Deb says, it would have been very difficult to understand the dynamics of a troubled mind in those days. SM Kovalinsky says um, that Vincent's now tainted by this by suicide and shame. Certainly, he's, he's sort of been tainted by his... Stephanie says, I think Vincent wanted his artwork to be his legacy. So, let me put this book aside for a second, but... The part that I want to emphasize here is Bailey writes the following. Little is known about the circumstances or the problems he had encountered, meaning Cor van Gogh, right? So now I'll put this book aside and I pick up this book. And this book is called The Unknown Van Gogh. And this is a book. This is a book about Cor van Gogh, right? So I'm simply disputing the fact or the claim or the allegation or the suggestion that little is known about Cor van Gogh because here is a book written about Van Gogh's brother. This is not a book written about Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, in other words, Vincent Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh, and then there's a little bit about Cor van Gogh. This is a book about Cor van Gogh. And it's not that little is known. It's not a case that little is known. And I think you could easily be dismissive and simplistic of Van Gogh and say, little is known about the circumstances of Van Gogh's death, but it looks like it was suicide. Well, that then leads you for 130 years to believe whatever you believe. But if you go and make the effort, and that's what you're going to do as a true crime uh, researcher, author, that's what we do in a true crime community. We go to the effort to find out when it says little is known, you try and find out more, especially where little is known. And so here is a book written about Van Gogh's brother. And guess what's in this book? It's an explanation of the circumstances in which he died. Right? It's a it's a elaboration, it's a story about how he went to South Africa, what happened when he was in South Africa who he was married to, and then is the, the end of his life. It's, it's, a, it's a full book, it's, and it's not a thin book either. It's a book with um, over 200 pages. So I don't know how you can say little is known about his life. Um, and the reason I know about this book was because when I was writing about artists, when I was writing... Uh, magazine articles about artists, um, the editor of that magazine contacted me and said, um, this book has just come out, um, would you please review it? You know, since you know something about artists, 
because there's a sort of a tenuous, con- well, not tenuous connection, but because it's connected to an artistic figure, would you want to write this biography, uh, this um, review? And so I was, number one, I was surprised. I mean, I don't actually know at that point if, it's, it's hard to say if I knew at that point that Van Gogh even had a brother. And I certainly didn't know that there was all of this information. And then I, I learned that his brother actually came to South Africa. Vincent Van Gogh's brother came to South Africa and unfortunately died in South Africa. And the, the circumstances of his death briefly are that he um, he came here, I think, around about the same time Van Gogh went to the asylum, his brother went came to South Africa. And you can, in a way, you could sort of argue that his brother didn't, you know, his brother could have visited him at the asylum and said, he said, cheers, Europe, I'm, um, I'm going to go and seek my fortune somewhere else. And you don't really get a sense that Cor got along very well with Vincent. You kind of got a sense that he was the younger brother and there was a bit of a black sheep scenario going on with Vincent. And he, they, were, they weren't on bad terms, but they certainly weren't on great terms. Certainly not, it wasn't a Theo and Vincent scenario. And they're not really letters between Cor and Vincent. Vincent doesn't write to Cor, Cor doesn't write to Vincent. Also, there are one or two occasions where Vincent would say to Theo, give my regards to Cor, but that's it. So they don't really have a great relationship. Cor comes to South Africa, he's trying, he's, he's, he comes here as an engineer, and what he's supposed to do is um, they've discovered gold in massive quantities. It's one of the biggest reservoirs in the world. They've also discovered diamonds, and now the British and all sorts of other interested parties want to get this out the ground and into the system, and so they need... South Africa to become a civilized country, a, a country with transport infrastructure and, you know, all the machinery that you need to for this to become industrialized. And so one of the things they need to do is build railways. And so that's where Cor van Gogh comes in. He comes in as a sort of a railway technician from Europe and he helps the South Africans build railways. And it is during this process that the Boer War breaks out And because he's from the Netherlands, he takes the side of the Boers. He takes the side of the, I guess, the local population. And so as a Dutch man, as a guy who's only been in South Africa for like 10 years, he's now fighting the British. And what happens during this process is um, initially the that the, the Boers um, are successful. It's almost like the war in Ukraine. Um, you have the small sort of little agglomeration of, of guerrilla fighters who withstand the mighty British Empire, and, and it's sort of quite unexpected. And, and for a short while, they sort of um, they win out or whatever. And then the British take on a different tactic, a scorched earth policy, and they just destroy everything and they burn farms and they just, you know, send more troops and it becomes like a, you know, a bloodbath. And there's concentration camps springing up all over the place. And unfortunately, Vincent van Gogh's brother gets caught up in this scenario, which is just unwinnable. And he is um, ultimately the way I understand it, is actually injured. Um, And the injury leads to a fever. And and under those circumstances, he's in a military scenario, kind of in a military hospital, and he's trying to recover from his his injuries slash fever when he's told that the British are coming, that that like a, you know, a, a British force is advancing on their position. And so as a result of that, he commits suicide because he doesn't want to go into concentration camp. And at that time, you, you, it wasn't like you go to a concentration camp and you come out a year later. 
you go to a concentration camp and especially if you're a man, you are you stand a really good chance of not coming out alive. So in other words, you you might be starved to death or whatever. And he'd obviously heard some of these stories and it was a prospect that he didn't see himself wanting to he didn't want to be captured, he didn't want to be imprisoned or worse. And so it's within these circumstances of him being ill already and the enemy advancing on him. He couldn't run away. He couldn't go with his compatriots. He couldn't escape where he was. And so that those were the circumstances of his suicide. And it is sad. It is very, very sad. But you can't say that um, he was a suicidal guy or that he had mental illness or any of that. And it's a very cruel thing to say not understanding the real story. You know, he was in a war, he was injured, he couldn't get away. And if you understand the Boer War situation, you know it was a very, also a very horrible kind of Holocaust, right? And it wasn't that he even, it wasn't even a case that he saw an army advancing on him and he was like, this is hopeless, I'm going to kill myself. He was injured and he couldn't leave he was kind of in a military hospital tent kind of thing and, you know, was informed that the British are coming, the British are coming. And he obviously was taking the position of they're not going to treat me. It's not going to be like they're going to put me in their hospital or they're going to treat me. You know, it's like I'm already in a vulnerable position um, scenario. That was the scenario that it was. So... So um, I wonder if there's something I can quote to you from this. Um, such a good book as well. Um, let's just see. You know, I can maybe go into this in a later episode. I have highlighted a couple of things, but... Um, What's quite interesting is is Cor van Gogh's real name is Cornelis, and that's actually my father's name. My father's um, original name is also Cornelis. Um, and uh, I'll just read the blurb for you. Uh, much has been written about Vincent van Gogh and his tempestuous relationship with his brother Theo, but few people know that there was a third van Gogh brother, Cornelis, who was raised in the Netherlands, but worked, married, and died in South Africa. The son of a Protestant minister, Cor spent his youth in a series of small Dutch towns with idyllic holidays, walking in the countryside with his artist brother before troubles and tragedies beset the Van Gogh family. In 1889, the 22-year-old Cor sailed to South Africa, where he worked as an engineer on the gold mines and on the railways. In the Anglo-Boer War, he joined the Boers, first as a railway engineer and later on commando, in the, on commando in the Free State, where in 1900 he suffered a fate that echoed his famous brother's tragic end. So they're not explicit in the blurb about exactly what does happen, but in the book they are. Um, the unknown Van Gogh recreates South Africa in the tumultuous last decade of the 19th century, reconstructs the personal story of a young immigrant from letters and other archival documents and explores his relationship with his famous brother, Vincent. With new insights based on original research, this book uncovers a figure who has been forgotten by history. And this was written by a South African author, right? And it was published in 2015. So, so seven years after this book was published, Bailey wrote his book, and Bailey, as I say, says little is known about the circumstances or problems he had encountered. So all I'm saying is we do know more, we do know a lot, and I don't think it's fair to say that Vincent was suicidal and his brother and sister also had mental illness. I don't think that that is fair. Um, I'm not uh, really going to deal with his sister, um, uh, we're going to go from there to Theo's problems. But uh, so, first of all, it's true that uh, core, we don't know much about the circumstances of it. 
And I also think when you do know the circumstances of it, um, I think quite a few people in that situation may have done the same thing. Um, that's that's really my position. So on the same question, let me just ask Corporal Deb and um, oh, Yvonne says my dad and son are named Nick. That's that's cool to hear. So Corporal Deb and uh, Hey Jealousy, let me know. How do you feel about the second point? Do, do you think I've made a convincing argument there or or is it 50-50 because I haven't really mentioned his sister? How do you feel about that? Have I sort of altered your perception a little bit in, in the second argument? Hello. <laughs> Do I need to repeat the question? Uh, Corporal Deb says 50-50. So you've, you've, um, hey, Jealousy says, I don't know. Okay, so let's say, let's have scored one point with the first one and, and I haven't with the second. So one out of two, does, does that make sense? Okay, so now we deal with Theo's problems. Now it talks about um, the first half of July that he was he had this extremely disturbing time and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, so here's my counter to that. First of all, it wasn't the first half of July. Um, Vincent visited um, July, Vincent visited his brother on the 6th of July. It's not the first half of July. It's not even the end of the first week of July. It's the 6th of July. So the 6th of July, and it's important to be explicit about this, on the 6th of July, he goes to his brother and, they, and there's this um, drama, there's this trouble, right? And it's important to be exact about the date because if you said that this happened in the middle of July or near the end of July, if you said it happened the day before he committed suicide, then you could say, I think this was definitely relevant. But the the longer the period between when this happened, when this happened, and the incident, the longer the period that separates the two, just as the longer the period between the self-harm story that happened in another city and in the south of France, and Orvez, the less relevant it is. It's just a fact. You, you can't sort of roll out the red carpet and say this has a direct bearing on that um, if it's separated by quite a lot of time, right? So, so once again, I just think Bailey's a little bit vague. He says, the first half of July had been extremely disturbing time for Theo. No, um, up until the 6th of July. So the, the 6th of July was when um, there was this definite consciousness of a, of a problem. And it didn't actually affect Vincent in the sense that, um, so there was a problem, but he wasn't so much affected that he was like, oh crap, I'm not going to paint anymore. Oh crap! My brother's going through hell. I I think I'm going to stay in bed today, or I'm going to I'm actually going to stay with him in Paris and support him, or whatever. He just carried on doing what he was doing. Um, so what I've actually written here next to Theo's problems is I've written true but not significant. Um, the other thing that I've highlighted here is he says, "This is Bailey's own words." Is he says. In fact, the situation was resolved just a few days later. Um, I'm a little bit confused. So this problem that Theo had that made Van Gogh suicidal, it was resolved that same month. In fact, not even that same month, just a few days later. It was sorted out. In other words, it wasn't um, not contingent. It, it, it wasn't... Um, perpetuating and it wasn't it wasn't kind of constant it wasn't current 
when Van Gogh committed suicide. So why on earth do you use that as a reason why he committed suicide? So in other words, you say Theo's problems were why Van Gogh committed suicide, but then you say, but he sorted his problems out. Okay. So then we turn to the next page and it says, and this is quite a good point. He says, inexplicably, Theo failed to tell Vincent that um, things were sorted out. So Bailey's saying, for reasons unknown, Theo just didn't tell Vincent that things were sorted out. So in other words, he's saying, Vincent actually committed suicide because he didn't know that things were not sorted out. Or, sorry, things were sorted out. Now, um, that's where I think it's a bit speculative because how do you know for a fact what Theo told Vincent and what he didn't? So, for example, um, Theo and Vincent met one another quite a few times directly. And they also met one another um, that, well, they, they didn't meet directly in terms of, how can I put it? They didn't meet directly, I think, subsequent to July 6th. But it is possible that it was conveyed verbally um, what the situation was. It's also possible that it was conveyed in a letter. And we also know that some of the letters weren't um uh, so, some letters that were written uh, have, have been sort of edited or taken out of the system. Um, it could have been communicated verbally to him um, sort of indirectly. So Theo could have spoken to Dr. Gachet or Theo could have spoken to Anton Hershig, who was staying right next door, who they were kind of also in a partnership with. Um, it also could have been conveyed to him indirectly through someone else because Vincent was also writing to Joe. And to me, that is actually the, the logical answer to that because there was a point where Vincent was worried about the situation and he, he I think he wrote to Joe and Theo, just like a letter addressed to Joe and Theo. And my impression was that Joe reassured him. So how on earth can you say that inexplicably Vincent didn't know the situation was resolved when Joe kind of reassured him? And then he said... He said something like, um, I was very, very worried about it, but then I wasn't. That's also in his letters. He, he literally said, um, you know, I was hesitant to come out there because I didn't know what I could do. And then he, he said like something along the lines of I was reassured. Now, you could make the argument, Fatikas, thanks a lot for that. You could make the argument that specifically in terms of his job, specifically in terms of um, uh, Theo's job Vincent wasn't told guess what I'm not going to leave um, my job uh, Boussard and Valadon I'm not, not going to leave my job um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of um, I was worried and, and, I, and I'm, I don't like my bosses but, but, it's, but it's sorted out you, you could make the argument that technically that conversation never took place and Vincent was like worried about that, right? But actions speak louder than words. And the fact that Vincent's last letter to his brother said, by the way, can you send me a bigger order than usual? I need all of these paints and I need these canvases. Doesn't that sound like Vincent's not worried about his brother having or not having a job, his brother having or not having an income? It sounds like his brother, it sounds like Vincent's kind of like assuming that it's working out or it will work out or it is working out, just based on that. Why on earth would you ask for, is someone leaving? Fatika says, can't stay too long I'm at work until 11.30. See you next time. Thanks for joining us, Faticus. Um, I hope you're going to watch the rest. The other thing is um, that they, they went on holiday. Um, I'm talking about Joe and Theo and the baby went on holiday in July. So if it's this terrible crisis, this terrible burden, this, this horrible situation that his brother's in, 
uh, how do you go on holiday in the middle of like um, this life and death situation? I, I'm saying if Vincent's worried about his brother because his brother's in this terrible bind, but in the middle of this terrible bind, he, he actually goes on holiday. How is it that this terrible situation? Who goes on a holiday? You know, he went home to his his um, his mother and, and family in in Newnan in the Netherlands. He left his work to kind of go on leave. Who does that in the middle of this huge work crisis? Your, your job actually gives you leave to go. Plus, you've got money to do that. You've got money to take your whole family on the train and go to wherever it is you're going with your whole family. And incidentally, Joe was still in the Netherlands when Vincent van Gogh um, committed suicide, right? When Vincent van Gogh lost his life, when the whole incident happened, Joe was still, we say in Afrikaans, caring, it means visiting. She was still there on holiday when all of this happened. So it's like, so if it was this horrible drama that it's like, this is a terrible burden for me, it couldn't have been much of a burden for Theo if he went on holiday in the middle of it. Uh, Nisi says all actions point other words. By the way, if there are people watching uh, or, li or listening, make sure you vote on the poll. Uh, that's one way. Actually, I'm not actually sure. I'm not actually sure if people who are non-members can vote, but I'm assuming I'm assuming they can because 109 have voted already. Um, anyway, then he also talks about, in terms of his concern about his brother, he talks about on. 23rd July, Vincent wrote about the storms that he feared were threatening his brother's household, right? So on the 23rd of July, he writes that he didn't write it on the 26th of July, the day before this happened. He wrote it four days earlier, right? And you might say that's nitpicking, but there was time for a response from that letter, there was time for a response from that letter, and there's also time, there was also in that letter him saying something along the lines of, I feel these storms affecting me, but then I was reassured, blah, blah, blah. So you've got to put this in context. You can't just say um, that he was worried about his brother and it was tearing him apart. He was also worried, but he was also, um, he also dealt with it. And if you don't believe that, if you say, well, that's what you think, not only is it said in the letter, it's also the fact that he continued painting. If, if, if he was so, felt he was such a big burden to his brother, in what way was he a burden to his brother? In what way was Vincent van Gogh a burden to his brother? Well, the fact that he was getting money from his brother every other day, and the fact that he, he was an expense to his brother because he kept asking for art supplies and kept asking for canvases and material, and he was failing to sell any of his art. And he sort of needed his brother because his brother was an art seller and an art agent, right? But the easiest way for him not to be a burden to his brother would be just to say, okay, I'm not going to ask you for, for, for paints. I'm not going to ask you for canvases. I'm not going to ask you for art supplies. And if it was really a big issue, he could also just have said, listen, if you're going through a tough time now with, you know, you've got a little kid, um, blah, 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 um, I, I won't paint for the next week, or I won't paint for the next two weeks, or I won't paint for the next month. And he doesn't do that. He doesn't even make that offer. In, in, instead, it's the opposite. He insists on painting, and he makes an order for a larger order from his brother, is asking for more paint, not less. So that's the uh, that's the third one. That and, and this one, I'm surprised he doesn't mention first because it's the mainstream reason is Vincent Van Gogh committed suicide because he felt he was a burden to his brother, and it's the most absurd argument you've ever heard. Because so so by committing suicide, I'm not going to be a burden. So by committing suicide, no one's going to be burdened by that. 
you, you're not going to have to come and pay for my funeral. You're not going to have to deal with me being dead. Uh, how, is, how on earth is committing suicide not burdening your family? I mean, so, I don't know. Um, I can tell you my mother committed suicide, and I can tell you it's a burden. It's a burden for other family members to bear. Um, in terms of this situation, um, I don't know. It's, to me, it's a ridiculous argument to say um, he committed suicide to not burden his family. If he didn't want to burden his family financially, it was very easy. I'm not painting anymore. As simple as that. So let's uh, ask um, let's ask a jealousy and um, where is is Corporal Deb still in chat or has Corporal Deb left? So anyway, if you guys are both here, do you think um, that argument? Where do you stand with that argument? Do you say that's 50-50 or do you think I've made quite a decent argument there? What, what's your, well, let's see where we are. This is the third, the third argument. Stephanie says Corporal Deb is here. Stephanie says, yeah, it, it is the ultimate burden. And I think it really did affect Theo. I mean, Theo died six months later. I think Theo was burdened by his brother's death. I think he was he was he was saddened by it. I think it was a horrible. I mean, he was right there. It was a horrible thing for Theo to go through. So, hey, jealousy says no. Theo didn't matter. Uh, Corporal Deb says had to step out for a phone call getting back to listening. Okay, so, hey, Jealousy, are you saying that I've I've made two good arguments so far of the three? Is that is that where you are at this point? So, um, I'm not saying that Theo didn't have problems. I'm also not saying that Theo's problems didn't affect Vincent. I'm saying... They didn't affect him significantly. They didn't drive him to commit suicide. Theo's problems didn't drive him to commit suicide. I'm saying, so the first one, him being suicidal, not true. Cause death and Will's depression, true, but um, requires explanation. Theo's problems, true, but not significant. So, hey, Julius says yes, two for three. So, I've got to score one more point and then I've, I've won three of the five arguments with hey, Julius, at least. So, we'll see. Um, so, now, we, now we're dealing with a very difficult one. Vincent's last words. Now, I'm the first person to put my hands up and say, this is the most compelling evidence by far that he did commit suicide that the person who died, yeah, the victim, the victim's own words, I don't want to say condemn him, but the victim's own words are, are difficult to refute. And why would you want to, right? So how do we do that? How do we do that? So on page 142, Bailey writes, and it's so important, this. Listen to this. this. I'm quoting from his book. I'm quoting from his own words. And I'm quoting from this difficult part dealing with Vincent's last words. As Vincent lay dying, Dr. Gachet tried to comfort him by saying that he hoped to save his life. Vincent responded that then it has to be done all over again. And when you hear that, you think, done deal. It's, um, you know, it's definitely suicide. It, it is absolutely incontrovertible, except the fact is you're getting this version of events from Dr. Gachet. And in true crime parlance, you're getting 
this version of events from a suspect. And I'm not saying he's an official suspect, and I'm not saying he was a police suspect. I'm saying I suspect him in the murder of Vincent van Gogh. And in a scenario where someone is a suspect in someone else's murder, anything they say, you've got to treat with caution. So the fact that you've got this most compelling, most important, most significant, most serious evidence that Van Gogh said whatever he said, and you're getting it from the suspect, is a bit of a difficulty. It doesn't mean that you say it means absolutely nothing or that, oh, that argu argument now nullifies it completely. It doesn't mean that you simply say, oh, I can now throw that away. It simply means you treat that statement with a bit of caution. In other words, you say this could be manufactured in order to defend or to support or to help the suspect in his particular situation, right, or not. So on the one hand, the argument is this could be manufactured in terms of this particular theory that you've got. On the other hand, you can say, well, maybe not, but let's see if you can find any other supporting evidence for that. In other words, is there more? Give me more. Because surely you don't just have one little strand that you can work with, right? So... So I'll give you a bit more. So first of all, the words here are, as Vincent lay dying, Dr. Gachet tried to comfort him by saying blah, 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 blah. Now, another witness, Adeline Ravu, says that her father said Dr. Gachet didn't say a word to Vincent van Gogh. Not only that, that, that you kind of got the sense that he didn't comfort him at all, that he just came and left. And also that he was absolutely no help at all, that he said that there was no hope. So yeah, you actually have reinforcement from a different source, but also a very critical source, also a source very close to the circumstances, the innkeeper, someone who we know for sure was also there, someone who also conveyed this to another very important source, an intimate source, his own daughter, that um, Dr. Gachet's behavior seems strange that he took a long time to get there after Vincent van Gogh arrived, took quite a long time to arrive, and then didn't spend a long time there, didn't seem to say anything, and then he was gone. The other thing to contradict, and I'm using this word uh, purposefully, is Bailey's words are, as Vincent lay dying, Dr. Gachet, blah, 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 that almost suggests that at the time that van Gogh was dying, uh, breathing his last, as, as he transitioned from life to death, Dr. Gachet was there and he was there to support and comfort him. And the fact is, when Van Gogh died, Dr. Gachet wasn't even there. He wasn't in the room. He wasn't in the building. He was, we don't really know where, but he was probably at his own home. So, um, that sentence is kind of misleading. I'm not saying it's purposefully misleading, but to say, as Vincent lay dying, Dr. Gachet tried to comfort him. I don't know if that statement is technically factually correct because some other people are saying specifically that Dr. Gachet seemed to be behaving in quite a cold way. And in another way where you say, well, one way to help Van Gogh would have been to attend to him medically because he was a doctor. So one way to have helped Van Gogh would have been to attend to him medically. And Dr. Gachet did have the ability to do that. He did have the capacity to do that. He did have the capability to do that. He had performed autopsies before. He was a military doctor. He was capable and certainly you would think he was specialized in dealing with bullet wounds because what else happens in, in war situations except shrapnel type injuries, bullet type injuries. Yeah, he's got a one person who's just been shot. He, he'd been shot literally, um, you know, um, a short time earlier. And instead of doing something then and there, he elects to do nothing. He ultimately elects to do nothing throughout the 30 hours. 
It's a li literally like saying to a doctor, doctor, we've got 30 hours to deal with this patient. Obviously, the doctor didn't know that in advance. But hypothetically, you could literally say, doctor, we've got 30 hours to save this patient's life. What are we going to do? And the doctor says, let's do nothing and take our chances. And so you, yeah, you had a doctor where there seems to be more evidence that he did an autopsy Certainly from Bailey's own version, there seems to be more support that that um, Dr. Gachet did an autopsy, in other words, cut Vincent open and did whatever, than that he did what he was needed to do, which is um, remove the bullet. Nisi says he is a major conundrum. P.W. Paddy says so much for the Hippocratic Oath. Yvonne Phillips says Gachet is so shady all the way around. Corporal Deb says um, something like, I believe this affected Theo to death. I'm not quite sure what that means. Stephanie says, someone mentioned that the other day. Okay. Uh, Patty says, so tragic to think that Vincent could have been saved. Absolutely. Uh, hey, Jealousy says, the doctor tries to make it about himself. Okay, so um, I also want to talk about what he, where he says, Dr. Geshe tried to comfort him by saying that he hoped to save his life. Well, that's a contradiction with what um, the innkeeper said that Dr. Geshe's assessment was. Dr. Geshe's assessment was um, that he missed his wounds and then it was like, well, there's no hope any left. And so here you've got Dr. Geshe apparently saying, I'm saying to, to Vincent, Vincent, I'm hoping to save your life. But then Vincent's saying, no, I don't want to live. So you kind of have this inversion. So my version is Dr. Gachet or possibly his son or possibly even his daughter, but one of the Gachets shot Vincent in flagrante, right, at, at his home or near his home. In other words, one of the Gachets imperiled Vincent's life, killed Vincent, injured Vincent. And now you have the story that Dr. Gachet is trying to save his life. And also the original story is that Vincent, um, so if Vincent's murdered, now he's saying to Dr. Gachet, to his murderer, well, then you're going to have to do it all over again, or I'm going to have to do it all over again. Does that sound likely? Anyway, so it's through Dr. Gachet that the story comes about that he says, his story is that he says to Vincent van Gogh, I want to save you and I want to give you hope. And Vincent says, no, there is no hope and I don't want to be saved. And if you do save me, I'm going to have to do it all over again. Then the next line is minutes before his final breath. Vincent told Theo, this is how I wanted to go. There's also almost the inference here that um, the doctor's still there, and we know he wasn't. The doctor wasn't there, it seems to be, for most of the time. This is quite a strong statement um, where he says, so Vincent says to his brother, this is how I wanted to go. I'm just trying to see where what the source is for that, 47. That's from Theo to Joe. So that is certainly a verifiable source. So Theo is, I guess, comforting Joe, saying that this is what he wanted. And you can make what you want out of that. You can decide that's true, and it could be. It could be that Vincent said, um, this is okay, this is what I want. It could also be that Theo is comforting his wife, by almost saying that this was meant to be, or um, Vincent accepted what was happening to him. But there's also a third scenario, and the third scenario is in the 13 hours Theo spent with Vincent, his brother told him what really happened and said something like, I'm so ashamed, I really don't want to get you into trouble. Um, Said, tell this story and I'm fine with it. 
you know, what the most important thing is, you know, I can't, the long-term thing is I'm not going to be here. The long-term thing is you, you are going to be here and we need to take care of you. You've taken care of me. Do this, for, do, do this for me, for you. Help me help you. Um, I want you to keep your job. Um, and it'll scandalize you if, if Dr. Geshe is scandalized. You know, it's going to ruin you if we accuse Dr. Geshe. It's going to ruin you if, if someone finds out that I try to kiss Marguerite and Dr. Geshe wasn't very happy and the whole syphilis thing or whatever. Um, you know, if Vincent van Gogh and Theo had spoken about syphilis between themselves, you know, that we've got this STD um, and it was in their letters and it was taken away, who knows whether that didn't come up? Who knows whether that didn't come up on the day that he was shot? Um, stay away from my daughter, whatever. And so what I'm trying to say is, Theo may have been in on this whole thing of it is the best idea that we blame this on Vincent because I could lose my job and I've just got a little child. I can't afford to lose my family. I am going to have to tell this horrible lie, um, but it's a believable lie. People will believe it, but at least I will save my family. I'll save the rest of my family. Um, then he also told his sister that he wanted to die. And I think an important, um, an important aspect to add to this is please don't conflate Van Gogh saying, I want, and he may, because he may have said this, he may have said, this is how I wanted to go. And he may have said he wanted to die. He may have said those words. But please don't conflate him saying this while he's bleeding to death, while he's injured, after he's been shot, with before that, that he wanted to die. Those are separate arguments. Those are completely separate arguments, right? You can take any person, any person who's injured, any person who is suffering, like Kor van Gogh, and as their suffering gets worse, as their anguish gets worse, as, the, as the, the, the actual life force drains out of them, gets worse, and ask them over and over again, do you want to live? And I can tell you, if the pain gets worse, if the anguish gets overwhelming, that answer may eventually change. And you see that in the Everest disaster, which I've covered, you have people climbing a mountain, they, they are on the mountain to live. They're on the mountain to um, experience life, to be alive, only to find themselves in as miserable situation that's of their own creation, and they blame themselves. And then they don't want to live. You had Scott Fisher, who apparently unzipped his own down suit to speed up his death, he, he was actually quite sick. Um, there seems to be some evidence that he had edema or he wasn't feeling very well. Um, also, Rob Hall could have, could have come down at a certain point and he elected to stay. Is that suicide? What I'm, what I'm trying to say here is you can have a situation where you've imperiled yourself in some way or you're injured in some way or you're suffering in some way and you don't see a way out of that. And in that situation, you may say, wow, I just, I just want to die. You know, um, when, in, if I take myself as an example, with my rib, there were, there were in the first few days where I couldn't sleep at all, there was this horrible sense of, how can I avoid this suffering? How can I avoid this terrible thing that I'm going through? And that wasn't even that bad. You know, I'm not bleeding to death or anything. And so you can also think with Helena Hutchins. She's been shot and it's this excruciating pain. 
and it is a mortal wound, and aren't you hoping for it to be over with? Aren't you hoping to transcend that horrible woundedness, that horrible injury? Aren't you wanting that terrible pain just to stop? Right? So please don't conflate whatever he felt and whatever he said after the shooting with, oh, no, he was suicidal. It's totally different. It's a totally different argument. Um, again, Theo saying to his sister Lys, he himself wanted to die, um, may have been also a similar sort of comforting statement to say, this is kind of what he wanted. He was suffering a lot and he's in a better place, right? This is look at some of your uh, not there yet, says you're hoping for the pain to go away. Stephanie says, good point. Nisi says, I've been in chronic pain for 30 years. I'm sorry to hear that. Trust me, I've said it quite a few times. I'm lucky in serious situations. I took it back. Hey, Jealousy says, I'm a wimp on pain. Now, can you imagine if you're bleeding to death? You bleed, literally are bleeding, um, and it's like your body is failing. You, you can't, you know, you can't sort of go to the toilet without help. You, you can't turn in your bed. Um, it, it's this horrible situation that's just getting worse, and also you're kind of getting delirious. Um, don't you want it to be over? And there are a lot of people who are who have got cancer and who have got serious illness that want it to be over. They do want to die. And you wouldn't say that they're suicidal. You would say, you, you could argue that is quite reasonable. To say, I don't want to be going through this. Um, so what I've written here is this is possibly valid, but... Also, Dr. Gachet's words, I don't mean that particular part, but the part where um, he says, Theo, who sat by Vincent's bedside throughout his final hours, was fully convinced that the shooting was a suicide. Um, maybe he was convinced by that, or maybe that's the story he told because he wanted to keep his job. Because if, it, if the art community found out that Dr. Gachet shot his brother, because his brother was behaving like a, some kind of lech or, you know, was half undressed trying to rape his daughter or whatever it was, trying to uh, understood that his daughter liked him but misunderstood or had drunk a bit too much wine that night or that uh, at dinner and um, whatever, whatever the situation was, perhaps it was the scandal and that couldn't afford to come out. And so this was the story that was told instead. And so what happens? Van Gogh is the martyr. Van Gogh takes the sacrifice upon himself and he had studied to be a, a priest all along and he had played the martyr role before uh, in, when he was in the Borinage. He, he lived like a poor person. He smelled, even the pastors there said, you shouldn't be living with these poor people. You should be preaching to them. We don't want you to be part of the poor. We want you to be attending to them. And so anyway, Van Gogh kind of takes upon this martyr role right at the end, and it's not the first time. It may even have been the third time if someone cut off his ear and he blamed himself. I don't think there's any way where Vincent actually says, I cut off my ear. Um, I could be wrong, but I don't think there's any way where he says, I cut off my ear. Um, but the fact is, it's a similar situation where he may have allowed Gorga off the hook. Why? Because of Gorga's business relationship with his brother, which was happening at the time. Um, Bailey says, uh, something about if Theo had even the slightest doubt as to whether it was a suicide, he would have never have let the matter drop. Well, he dropped the ear matter pretty quickly. Like it wasn't like Vincent cut off his ear and then he was sort of attending to his brother the whole time. He kind of left his brother at the asylum and he, he kind of went on with his life. Um, 
And instead, he actually chaperoned Gogol back to Paris. So he helped his he helped Gogol in a way more than he helped his brother. Um, and this is the part that I've highlighted here, is he says, in terms of the Vincent Last Words section, he says, the obvious course of action would have been to consult Dr. Geshe, meaning if Thea had any concerns, if Thea had any suspicions, the obvious thing to do would have been to go to Dr. Geshe and seek his medical legal advice. The doctor would have, and so it's like, if Theo had had any sort of uh, reservations or any like suspicions, well, go to Dr. Gachet. Well, Dr. Gachet is in the best position as the suspect to make up his own story, to say, no, 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 you've got nothing to worry about. This is definitely a suicide. No, 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 no. You know what? I actually saw Vincent yesterday and he was really emotional and blah, blah, blah. He could make up any story. Um, he could also have said, you know what, I tried to comfort your brother and I tried to save his life. I said, Vincent, can I please take the bullet out of you? And Vincent said, you will not take the bullet out of me, otherwise I'm going to have to do it all over again. But is that Vincent van Gogh's words or are those Dr. Gachet's words? So even Bailey says the obvious thing for Theo to have done if he wanted help in prosecuting this case, was to go to Dr. Gachet. What do you think Dr. Gachet is going to do? What do you think if the case, if, if Theo did say, I suspect foul play, let's take this case to court, and Dr. Gachet is the suspect, and Dr. Gachet is a doctor, and Dr. Gachet is also the main witness, who do you think would have won that court case? In other words, if it was like, the murder of Dr. Gachet court case went to court. Do you, who, who do you think would have won that court case? Yvonne Phillips says, yes, sepsis and the shutting down of major organs is very painful without pain management. Stephanie says, and has a gun using the same bullet in Vincent. Okay, so um, and then it ends here that Dr. Geshe would surely have advised if there was even a remote doubt whether it was a suicide. Really, do you think so? Do you think Dr. Geshe would have said, you know what, I don't know if it was a suicide. Or do you think Dr. Geshe would have said, you know what, it was definitely a suicide. Van Gogh told me he's, he's a really honest guy. Do you think? Do you really think that Dr. Gachet would have um, advised if there was doubt, or do you think Dr. Gachet would have reinforced certainty that it was suicide? So just to quote Bailey right here, Dr. Gachet would surely have advised that if there was even a remote doubt about whether it was suicide, the authorities should be promptly informed and a post-mortem examination conducted. Well, guess who would have, who would have performed the post-mortem? Dr. Gachet as well. So uh, even if he did perform the autopsy, you could have said, oh, no, no, this is definitely a suicide. Based on my post-mortem expertise, this was definitely a suicide as well. And so what do you think of that? So the last word, so let's just see, what did I write here? Okay, so what do you guys say about that? Uh, I don't know, Corporal Deb, if you followed that whole section, do you think I've made a convincing argument there? To me, this is the the hardest hurdle to, to cross. This is the this is the hardest um, case to make in terms of the suicide murder thing. It is Vincent's last words? Um, what do you think? Um, hey, jealousy. What do you think? about that particular aspect. Nisi says, can't trust 
the good old doctor. Paddy says, Dr. Geshe had all the bases covered. Yvonne says, Geshe held all the cards. We've now had 115 votes. We still had Van Gogh was murdered at almost 69%. So, so hey, jealousy, am I now, is it now three, three out of four? One, two, three. Have I won three out of four points with you uh, or not? Stephanie asks a really good question. Where did Dr. Masri go in all of this? And Dr. Masri certainly makes an appearance in um, in um, in Loving Vincent, but that is a that is a fantastic question. Hey, jealousy says three out of four ain't bad. Okay, so that brings us to the very last point, which is kind of a it's kind of a weak argument in true crime which is like because most people believe something that's that's why it's likely true so you know um, a couple of cases I, I can't say for sure I don't know whether most people believe John Bonet Ramsey was whatever happened to her was due to an intruder I don't know if that's what most people believe, but it's certainly, I think, the mainstream view. So the the view that's permitted in the mainstream or perpetuated in the mainstream or that you hear more constantly repeated habitually in the mainstream is that John Bonet was the victim of some kind of intruder, right? Obviously, if you say something else, you can get sued and other documentaries were sued, so that's some explanation for why the mainstream version is the mainstream version. In the Madeleine McCann case, you kind of have, a, I think, a similar situation where it's also a stranger is responsible for what happened to her, and that is the mainstream media position. I, I can't say whether the majority believe that or not. I, I really don't know. But um, certainly if you... Um, make claims that it wasn't a stranger, then you can face legal, um, uh, what's the word, legal action. So, um, so the mainstream media position seems to be that. And so you can ask, and I'm not asking you to answer this, but I'm just saying you can ask the question, is the mainstream media position accurate? Is the majority position accurate? Not there yet says that I lean to an intruder, okay? So, so um, yeah, also, I'm also sorry to hear that you've got spinal nerve pain. Anyway, so, so, um, The question is, is this um, assessment that we've got um, deep enough, accurate enough, true enough that having been repeated for 130 years, it, it is, it, it, it doesn't need revising, it doesn't need fine tuning, it was true um, 130 years ago and it's true today, 132 years later, right? The really interesting thing with this um, on page 143 is um, the very first line under his title for number five, the very first sentence he writes for under everyone at the time believed it was suicide is Dr. Gachet undoubtedly believed it was suicide. That's the very first line that he's got there. Everyone at the time believed it was suicide. Now let's start with reinforcing our case. Number one, Dr. Gachet undoubtedly believed it was suicide. And what I've written is that means absolutely nothing. 
The other thing that I think is fascinating, and I didn't write this, this is Bailey's version, is that Dr. Gachet, who undoubtedly believed that Van Gogh committed suicide, in his note to Theo, doesn't mention that it was suicide. And instead he says um, his brother wounded himself, and he said he chose his words with care. He didn't say he shot himself. Um, he says he chose his words with care. Yes, he did. He did choose his words with care. Now, I don't really understand why a doctor wouldn't tell a family member in an emergency, it's kind of like a 911 call, in an emergency, in a critical situation where time is absolutely of the essence, why you wouldn't tell him exactly what happened to his brother, number one, because you're a doctor, number two, because it's a family member, number three, because it is an emergency. Why are you choosing your words with care and ultimately saying not your brother's been shot, but your brother wounded himself? Because his brother had wounded himself before. He'd cut off his ear, right? In, in the schema of this case, it's like, well, my brother wounded himself before he, he cut off his ear. Did he not cut off his other ear? He doesn't clarify in what way he wounded himself, but wounded himself could be anything. He could have stubbed his toe. He could have tripped over his painting supplies and stabbed himself with a paintbrush, right? Um, he could have fallen down the stairs on his way to his room. Uh, he could have cut himself on a wine glass and on and on and on. Why on earth can't you be explicit as a doctor about what happened to your patient who this particular brother has actually asked you to be the doctor for. And I've got an answer for that. One of the reasons why you'd want to minimize and euphemize Van Gogh's injury is so that it would delay the brother coming to the aid of his brother and also coming to, um, yeah, sort of you would you want him to come later rather than sooner. Why would you want that? Well, by the time the brother gets there, either his brother's died or his brother's delirious or he's beyond saving. Why would you want to save your patient? And so um, does, does that make sense? So I agree, he did choose his words with care and... Um, Interestingly, he, he had a diary entry where the, the doctor wrote clearly and succinctly, suicide de Van Gogh. So in his own diary, he wrote Van Gogh committed suicide, but due to the letter to, his, to Van Gogh's brother, he says, oh, he just wounded himself. And he doesn't mention a gun or a gunshot anyway. Why, why not? I just want to see what the source is for the diary entry. Number 50. On this date, it was actually a suicide attempt rather than a suicide. So it is possible that Dr. Gachet may have written these words at some point after the death. Really interesting. I hadn't actually considered that. So, so yeah, so I've kind of put a question mark here. Um, and it just shows you how critically I actually wasn't thinking very, I wasn't thinking very, um, critically when I when I read this, uh, it says, in his diary entry, the doctor wrote clearly and succinctly, suicide Van Gogh, and Bailey, Bailey specifies that the date of the diary entry was the date that he shot himself, so he was actually still alive. So in other words, the doctor is saying before he's even died that, 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 that he'd committed suicide, when technically at that time there's only a suicide attempt. It seems a little bit hasty, doesn't it? That in your diary entry for the day that something happened, you write suicide, but the guy's actually still alive. And so I think Bailey's point is that, what's Bailey's point? He says, so it is possible that Dr. Geshe may have written these words at some point after the death. So the way I understand that, and I could be wrong, I may, may be misunderstanding, 
is that Dr. Geshe wrote that Van Gogh had committed suicide in his diary after he died, but then on the previous day. So in other words, he didn't write it on the day that he's writing in his diary. He's writing it after the event, but earlier in the chronology, if that makes sense. So, uh, Paddy says something rotten in Orvez. Uh Stephanie says he already has his cause of death. It, it does seem very hasty, even, um, yeah, I mean, anyway. So then it says, the day after the shooting, Dr. Gachet spent much of the time with Vincent, talking with him and monitoring his condition. Now, now so far in his argument that everyone at the time believed it was a suicide, it's all about Dr. Gachet. Dr. Gachet wrote about it in his diary. Dr. Gachet had no doubt. Dr. Gachet chose his words with care. Dr. Gachet spent so much time with Vincent. And in this last point where he says, Dr. Gachet spent much of the time with Vincent talking with him and monitoring his condition, that is not the version we get from other sources. In fact, the version we get from other sources is that Dr. Gachet didn't spend much of the time with Vincent, number one. Number two, didn't talk to him at all, according to some sources. It's like, I think the version you get almost from Adeline Revu is they, they had no idea that, that Dr. Gachet and Vincent van Gogh were friends. They, they, they had no, there was like no sense of, um, there's, there's some kind of connection or relationship between the two. Um, it seemed almost the opposite because the doctor comes and goes, doesn't say a word, and says that he's got no hope. And so you've got this one story of the doctor coming quickly, coming late, um, uh, doing his work quickly and apparently quite callously, leaving quickly, and then he's also not there when Van Gogh dies, so he's not there to comfort him in his final hours. Um, and then you've got this other version of Dr. Gachet who sobs at the funeral and who spends so much time at his bedside like a true friend who talks with him, who offers to help him, who offers to save him. And Van Gogh says, no, 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 please don't save me. You've got two versions. I didn't come up with the two versions. The two versions are explicitly part of the story. That's why there's some doubt about this. So I'm not going to read the whole rest of this because it goes on and on, but the next part that I've highlighted is, it says here, Vincent's artist friends who attended the funeral accepted his death as suicide. Bernard spoke at length with Theo, Dr. Gachet, and Revu, writing the following, uh, sorry, writing the following day to tell Aurier that Vincent had fired a revolver at himself. He added that his suicide was absolutely calculated and undertaken with total lucidity. Fifty-four. I just want to make sure of the source there. Fifty-four. Bernard to Aurier. Okay. So now in terms of this, um, that is like someone coming after the fact and then becoming a witness. So it's Vincent's artist friends who attend the funeral, um, they come there and other people tell them what they know happened. So let's look at the order in which this happens. The first people that are really present are the innkeeper and Dr. Gachet. Between the innkeeper and Dr. Gachet, Dr. Gachet is like the authority. Dr. Gachet is the doctor. Dr. Gachet is the friend of Van Gogh. Dr. Gachet is in a position to know what to do, right? And so when other people come there, do you think they go and ask the innkeeper what's going on? No, they ask the doctor. So the doctor gives them a version of events. The doctor tells them, I tried to save him, um, he told me he shot himself, and that's how the story kind of begins. Um, I 
I don't know what it means when you say his suicide was absolutely calculated. That, that to me almost sounds like it's premeditated, like he decided, okay, in three days I'm going to do this and at that time I'm going to do that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's completely the opposite. Bailey's version sounds like it was completely random where he painted a picture in the morning and then in the evening just decided he was going to commit suicide. But then he had this will to live come back and then it came and then it went. So how is it absolutely calculated? Also, if he had written a letter saying, if he had written a suicide note or he would written a... Um, something saying, I'm just you know, I'm so miserable, then you could say it was absolutely calculated. I don't think it was. I don't get that sense. Um, it goes on to say, um, another witness to the death was Hershey, who in 1911 recorded uh, what his friend had told him. I wounded myself in the field. I fired the pistol. So Hershey, I think, is definitely more reliable than... Dr. Gachet, uh, and according to this, um, Vincent told, I'm not quite sure if it's um, what Hershey told his friend or what Vincent told Hershey. I'm not quite sure, it's not quite clear here. Another witness to the death was Hershey, who in 1911 recorded what his friend had told him. And so it probably is Van Gogh told her, she, I wounded myself in the field. I fired the pistol. But just look at those words. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Van Gogh can't actually say while he's alive, I killed myself because he's still alive. I mean, you know, he can't like say, I killed myself because he's, he's not killed. Anyways, so, so according to this, he says, I wounded myself in the field. I fired the pistol. Um, and that, that that is him saying where it's located. He's saying, I did this in the field, right? That's not a bad, that's definitely not a bad argument because this is coming from Hershey. And it's Hershey quoting Van Gogh apparently. And it's... Um, yeah, so isn't that what Van Gogh told his brother Theo? I wounded myself in the field, I did this, I fired the pistol. He told the police something similar. He said, don't blame anyone else, my body is mine. But what is he trying to protect someone? Um, so my argument against this, right, and it's, it's quite a, I think, quite a clever argument is, so the traditional narrative is that Van Gogh was troubled, he had mental illness, he was suffering, he uh, cut off his ear, he kind of went mad, and then he committed suicide, right? Now, my counter argument to that is, well, now is absolutely calculated and he did what he did with total lucidity. So it's like, so the whole argument with Van Gogh is that he, he was mad, that he sort of um, was this troubled guy who couldn't think straight sometimes. But when he commits suicide, he's absolutely normal, he's not mad, um, he's not troubled, he's not... Um, seeing visions is not is not the mad artist so what so what is the story i mean surely you commit suicide because you are going mad or you are are troubled or because you're confused or be, you know like in the rebecca zahau case she's the story is that she felt so guilty she felt so confused about the state of the little boy who fell down the stairs she felt so kind of muddled up in that whole thing that she did something out of character, right? Um, so the same with Van Gogh. He's supposed to be so troubled by Theo. He's supposed to be suffering from mental illness like his other siblings. Um, he's supposed to be, what are the other arguments? 
is supposed to be so suicidal that, um, and then suddenly suicide is absolutely calculated. It's a very clear-minded thing, undertaken with total lucidity. So as I said, so now he isn't troubled or mad, but completely rational. So I think you've got to pick your argument. Is Van Gogh this, this and that, but he committed suicide? Or is he this and that and he committed suicide? What is your actual argument? Stephanie says, I feel like he'd want to have last written words for his family, especially if he didn't want to be a burden. Yeah, I mean... The fact that he didn't write anything down to me is a big red flag. The, you know, the fact that um, he, he wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters, he wrote about everything, but I'm not going to write about why I'm doing this. You know, a note like that would be a comfort to the family. Otherwise, it's like, why, 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 why did you do this? And he did care about his family. So now we come to the very end of this. Um, Bailey says suicidal behavior is complex. And then, he, and then he talks about five years earlier, Vincent said that dying is hard, but living is even harder. And he, he said something about, um, so I guess he's again reinforcing this whole thing that society as a whole just believed that it was suicide. He says, um, Vincent had long suffered from a sense of rejection by society. So that to me is just a, you know, the whole argument that um, what happened five years ago or that he'd been rejected for, from society by his whole life, that is the opposite of arguing why he committed suicide then, meaning He'd been rejected by society all along, so, so why would it affect him then? Um, he, he'd been a lot lonelier before Orvez than he was when he was in Orvez. The time that he was in the asylum was, was really a horrible time. He'd lost his ear. He'd lost a lot of respect from the people in all I think his brother was embarrassed. His family were scandalized by that. Um, he was in an asylum. He was kind of with, with mad people and sick people. Um, that was the time to feel rejected and miserable. And as I made that argument over and over and over again. So why didn't he do that then? Um, and I don't think he had a sense of rejection of society when he was in Auvers. His brother was nearby. His brother was visiting him. He, um, he had this other artist, Anton, living next door. He had a good relationship with the innkeeper. He, he painted the innkeeper's daughter twice, I think. Um, he was friendly with the Gachets. He had attended Dr. Gachet's uh, children's birthday parties. He'd had lunch and breakfast and whatnot at Dr. Gachet. Um, Dr. Gachet said, you can come over whenever you like. He painted Dr. Gachet's portrait. He painted his daughter's portrait. He supposedly painted Dr. Gachet a second time, which I don't believe, but also painted, um, uh, wanted to paint Marguerite's portrait a second time as well. Um, so, you know, he made connections in Orvez, that, that he better connections there than he had 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 for a long time. So you, if you're going to argue, make the argument about loneliness, he was the least lonely when he was in Orvez. Well, this is already three hours, 18 minutes. I need to wrap up. So I don't think you can go to five years earlier to talk about how lonely he was when he was less lonely in the summer of 1890. I don't think you can talk about the rejection he felt by society when um, he was included in this one family and he was in a weird way included by another family. By, by staying in the inn, in the Revue Inn, 
they knew him and they cared about him and they liked him. Um, Adeline remembered him fondly. They, um, you know, he was he was in a in another sort of way part of the Ravu family. Um, so that's kind of like what Bailey seems to tie the biggest sort of thing onto is that Van Gogh committed suicide because he was lonely. That, that's what he's got here. He says, Vincent's feeling of, sorry, um, Vincent's feeling of loneliness in the final months suggests that this preyed on his mind. Um, and then he talks about in September 18, 19, 1889 while at the, at the asylum. Um, it is true that Van Gogh felt lonely. It is true that in the summer of 1890, he felt lonely. He talked about it. He drew a, 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 he painted a painting where he said, I'm trying to depict extreme loneliness. But he also said that he felt invigorated by the countryside. He also said that he was experiencing joy. He also said that um, things were improving and he, he was hopeful. Um, so, yes, he did feel lonely, but he was less lonely then than at, at other times. So, um, anyway. So, again, uh, he jumps out of the finale, Bailey. He jumps back to September 1889, almost like a year earlier, and he talks about a letter where he, he spoke about the feeling of loneliness takes hold of me in such a fearsome way that I hesitate to go out. You, you jump totally out of your own timeline to reinforce your case um, where Van Gogh never hesitated to go out because he painted every single day for 70 days. So that feeling of loneliness that was so bad when he was at the asylum wasn't so bad in Auvers. Um, he says two weeks before the shooting, he wrote that in depicting the wheat fields, he was expressing sadness, extreme loneliness, yes. But he was painting until the end. He didn't stop painting. In fact, he painted on the day that he died. He painted on the day that he died. So you can't make the argument that, you know, when he was so lonely, he, he, was, he was so overcome that he couldn't paint. Right, so that's, that's your argument that when he felt so lonely, he couldn't paint. But then on the day that he died, he did paint. So how was he so lonely? I mean, he, he wasn't so lonely that he couldn't paint, that he, 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 he sort of felt like I'm too distraught to actually um, focus on this because you've got to, 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 to create. You've got to have some energy. You've got to have some focus. You've got to have some integrated thinking. You've got to have that cognitive energy, right? And if it's being drained away by feelings of loneliness or self-pity or misery, you're not going to have the ability to create. And yet he did. At his funeral, the paintings above his coffin were still wet with his paint because he was still motivated, because he was still, he had this energy. And I believe part of this life energy manifested in his libido. And part of his libido manifested in, he was alone for this whole time in the asylum, but also away from female company. And he probably felt feelings of attraction to 21-year-old Marguerite. And at the same time that the spirit of life was returning to him, Part of the problem of his loneliness was he wanted a girlfriend. Part of the, the loneliness that he felt was he wanted to love a woman. He wanted a woman to love her, and he felt attracted to this particular woman. Maybe he thought her being friendly to me is maybe she's flirting with me, and maybe she wasn't. Or maybe she was, and Dr. Gachet didn't like it. Or maybe she was flirting a little. And so his very last sentence in making these arguments, Bailey's very last sentence in making these arguments that he committed suicide is, he was lonely and sometimes it was more than he could bear.
And that actually comes from Theo, I think. I think that is what Theo wrote. And it's true, he was lonely. And sometimes it was more than he could bear, but I don't think he committed suicide because he was lonely at other times. He was going through things that were more than he could bear, much worse than in Orvez, for example, when he lost his ear. Um, does that make sense? Uh, not there, it says, maybe because he had made a clear decision for himself. It brought him a strange sense of peace. I, I think one thing that is possible is that instead of being rejected by society, maybe Marguerite rejected him. Maybe he said, maybe he, um, over two months, he developed these feelings. He wanted to paint Marguerite's uh, portrait and maybe Marguerite said to him, listen here, I think you're a nice guy, but I think you've got the wrong idea. Um, you know, it's not going to work out. And maybe maybe in that sense, it was a similar scenario to Brian Laundry. You know, like, obviously um, a little bit different, but like, I can't have you. I can't have anyone. And, you know, that's certainly a possibility, but that's not, that's not what, what, what anyone is mentioning here. Um, there's also very little mention of his disturbia. You know, if, if he was supposedly so lonely, why doesn't he mention it in his letters? I'm talking about the letters written between June and July. Why does he not mention that loneliness is a big factor in his letters? It comes up maybe once, and, I, and I'm not exaggerating. Van Gogh talk is a very expressive artist. I mean, his brand of art is known as expressionism, right? His art is very expressive. His letters are very expressive. He's an expressive character. And he talks about, he, is, he kind of wears his heart on his sleeve. So why on earth, if you're feeling lonely, why don't you say, why don't you mention that? Why, don't you, why, why is there so little mention of his disturbia in his letters? And he wrote a lot of letters. He wrote a lot of letters in June and July. Why is there no mention of that? Why is it mentioned like once? So if it was this big issue, why is he not bringing it up? So that is my story. Um, Stephanie says, I cannot rule out murder. Um a couple of reasons why that I think support suicide to some extent are there are a couple of days where he doesn't write letters near to the end. It's sort of in the last sort of week or so, he doesn't really write that many letters. He'd written more letters earlier. You can sort of explain that by the fact that, well, his brother was on holiday. So it's like, I'm not going to write to you while you're on holiday because you've got other things that are going on. Um, you with my mother and you with my sister and you know you busy with that and you somewhere else you preoccupied with other stuff but again the fact that he his last letter to his brother asks for more pain supplies that is a that is a strong indication of intent that's a strong uh, demonstration of his ideas for the future that he intends to continue painting and the fact that he painted 70 paintings in 70 days, he, he, didn't, he may have faltered a little bit in his letters, but in terms of his paintings, he didn't. So why on earth, in terms of that, it doesn't show any sign of, of disruption, right? Uh, hey, Jealous, he says, it's borderline now. Has Robbie Robin gone away? Robbie Robin says, um, night, night, everyone, and thank you. I will catch the rest tomorrow. Corporal Deb says maybe he was too proud, so that is possible. But he was very close to his brother. Um, so he's saying he was too proud to say he was lonely, but not shy to say that he would taken his own life. Um, Stephanie says he had an unfinished letter to Theo in his pocket. Stephanie's got some great 
insight. It's, it's, it's always wonderful when there's someone else who's um, appraised, well appraised with the facts of the case. It's always good to see. Uh, Corporal Depp says, I still believe Vincent was beyond saving in his mind and didn't want to deal with life. Um, yeah, I must, I must say, if you say that, <clears throat> I don't know, I don't really know what you mean. Do you mean in the summer of 1890? Because uh, I spent about six or seven episodes emphasizing that he was infused with life, he was enthusiastic, not my words, Bailey's words, just talking about how joyful and happy and inspired and encouraged and uh, activated he was during June and July. So so you have all of that and then, oh, suddenly he's suicidal. Oh, okay. Uh, Stephanie says, thanks for facilitating my passion. Thank you, Stephanie, for being so, um, uh, you know, interested and, um, uh, you know, um, your, your attention and your interest is definitely um, fun and enjoyable, definitely from my perspective. So thanks for that. Well, this is really a long uh, live, three hours, 30 minutes. It's almost a record, I think. Not there yet. It says, I find autistic people very in tune with their emotions. Corporal Depp says, the whole life, the combination of things that got him down. I don't know. So you might say Van Gogh was so upset because he never sold a single painting. That in itself isn't true. But you might say... You know, he just got so down because he was a failure as an artist. Well, he'd been a failure his entire artistic career. So why would he, if anything, he was in a state of resilience where he's painting every single day. So um, beyond those arguments, which I feel like I've dealt with one by one, um, the fact that they didn't find the gun to me is, you don't really need to. You don't really need to make an argument beyond that, and it's the exact same argument applied to Brian Laundry, in the sense of if they didn't find a gun um, near Brian Laundry, then I wouldn't be convinced that he committed suicide just because it's like, so what happened to the gun? I mean, if he committed suicide, what innocent explanation is there for the gun not being there? And as it turned out, the gun was right there. The gun was found next to Brian Laundry, right? And in, in Van Gogh's case, what happened to the gun? Why was the gun not found? And so we're not talking about New York... Um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we're talking about a tiny little village where there were very few people and there were very few places to go and anything that's lying around you would have found. And what else was there for Theo or anybody else to do except um, try and find out what had happened? You know, when, when they went to that town, you know, you've got the funeral, you've got the funeral arranged, what else is there to do? So um, the fact that they never found the gun, I'm talking about not that day, not that month, not that year, not for 10 years afterwards, not for decades afterwards, they didn't find the gun, is a serious problem because most people who shoot themselves, um, the gun is right there and that they're, they're not going to cover up that, that aspect. I mean, they're not going to shoot themselves and then hide the gun away, they did. Um, you know, that's not going to be a factor. And it's just unfortunate that when the police spoke to him, they didn't ask him about the gun. Where did you get the gun? Where's the gun now? Um, where were you? Just those three questions. Couldn't the police have asked that question? Uh, 
Uh, Yvonne Phillips says the gun should have surfaced quickly. Why didn't it? <laughs> Stephanie says a mentor, professor, and friend in Nick. Um, I've recently watched A Beautiful Mind, and I, I, I thought the Professor Nash playing the um, teacher in that, I thought that was quite funny. Just the way he's a, um, a brilliant, but not particularly, um, well, certainly not in the beginning, not a very well liked um, professor. Towards the end, it's a little bit different though. Stephanie says, How lucky we are. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Corporal Deb says, This has been very enlightening for me. Plenty of argument. I'm 50 50 now. Okay. Okay, well, the uh, 123 have voted, and of you, 68% feel that he was murdered. So um, I, I'm not saying it's absolutely 100% open and shut. Um, the reason cases like John Bonet, Madeleine McCann, um, Rebecca Zahao, um, Amanda Knox, um, Chris Watts, even to some extent, um, the Barry Morphy case, the reason why we, the reason why they're high profile, the reason why we keep thinking about them is because it's not absolutely clear. That's why it captures your imagination. And I think some of the lack of clarity leads, leads us to projection. Some of what you're seeing is what you want to see, not what is actually there. In the Van Gogh story, I really believe there's plenty, there's too much projection. People see the, uh, people see too much of the struggling artist and, um, you know, this magical transformation from torture to, um, you know, this incredible art, right? People see that too much. Okay, I'm going to have to sign off now. I'm feeling a little bit of pain. I'm not exaggerating. I'm feeling a little bit of uh, discomfort. I have been sitting here for quite a long time. Um, but I think it was quite a good episode. I did touch on all the things that I wanted to touch on. Um, I'm going to take a quick lozenge here. Um, thanks, guys, for being here. Um, thank you to all the members who, who are here. I see there are 51 people in um, who are watching. That to me is the perfect sort of lecture size. Um, 40, 50 people, that's a nice classroom. But thank you to all the members. Thanks for all the votes. Um, also, thanks to the mods, Stephanie, and um, as Jean left us. I don't know if Jean's still here. Um, Sharon Tuck as well. This was a very long live. So, Stephanie, the fact that you stayed here throughout, you're a real trooper. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I, I must say I'm missing Bria. We haven't seen her for a while, but I mean, it's 20 to 5 in the morning here, probably about the same time in France. So, um, kind of understandable. Nisi says, great night, feel better, go stretch and hit the hay. Stephanie says, rest your body and voice. Thanks a lot for that. Susan Becker says, very good session tonight. We have a great group. We do, don't we? Um, Yvonne says, thanks, Corporal Deb, and hey, Jealousy. Thanks to you guys for your interest. Uh, you don't have to agree the whole idea is to just see where the information takes us. Patty says, recover quickly. You are a fearless leader. Thanks for that. Not there yet, says, don't sit too long in one position. I definitely need to get up. Um, Terry Dean says, am I here for the best part? Well, there's the best part is it's just the end of the, the show. Tim is not around. Bon, bonsoir, which means good night in French.
So thanks a lot for listening. I would really like my research to sort of go out there. So if you watching this uh, after I've recorded it, say a week or a month or whatever, do read this book if you're interested. It's Martin Bailey's Van Gogh's Finale. There's also this book by Chris Kuman on the unknown Van Gogh. And if you'd like my take, my research all in one place, uh, read uh, The Murder of Vincent Van Gogh. That's on Amazon. So check that out. Uh, well, Nisi says, my mom bought your book tonight. That's wonderful to hear. Thanks a lot. I hope she enjoys it. I hope she finds it interesting. Corporal Deb says, my Winnie says hi to Timmy. Cool. Terry says, very excited for the replay. This is such well time, such time well spent. Thank you for your research, passion and patience. Nick, love to all. And on that note, um, guys, I hope you, you have a good rest of your evening. Um, Stephanie and I will be back with a um, show that is dedicated to our prime suspects, Dr. Gashay and his son. I'm not sure when that's going to be. It'll depend on Stephanie, but we'll, we'll definitely let, let you know. But that should be quite an interesting show. There's a lot to get through. Um, it is important if you're going to blame a murderer that you're going to um, provide some reinforcement for that. So we've just gone through Bailey's arguments for suicide. I've tried to counter all of them. Now we're going to go into the next sort of phase, which is Dr. Gachet and his son. And we're going to see how they profited from Van Gogh's death directly. They profited from his death not only um, a short time later, but a long time later as well. Um, and so we're just going to go into that. We're going to go into the history of the Gachet family subsequent to the death of Vincent van Gogh. So that should be quite interesting. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Stephanie, thanks for putting the link up there. Um, and uh, thanks for everyone who's voted. And uh, take care, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot for joining me. Ciao.